Chapter Twenty Seven of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nissa Schmidt. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter Twenty Seven Apparitions. An apparition is a phantasmal being, commonly called a ghost, which is seen by sensitive individuals under certain conditions. Before we can speak more fully of apparitions, we must answer the question which naturally occurs, namely, what is a ghost? Modern theories and ideas on this question have changed greatly within the past quarter of a century. At that time, if an ordinary scientific man were questioned on this subject, he would probably reply that it was a hallucination, the result of a diseased mind, and had no existence in reality outside the imagination of the subject who perceived it. But in these days this idea has been greatly modified, and it must now be admitted that ghosts are very much more complicated than this. In the first place, when the Society for Psychical Research began its investigations in 1882, it was found that a large percentage of cases of apparitions occurred at or about the time of death. Some occurred before and some after, but most of them were approximately at that time. Further, the subjects who perceived or saw them were not diseased or imaginative persons, and probably never had another experience of this character either before or afterwards the questions naturally arose why this connection what is the bond uniting the dying person with the apparition seen some scientific men it is true have come forward and stated that this connection is due to chance and that there was no real connection whatever this is however disproved by the report of the society as the result of several years work they succeeded in obtaining answers from some thirty thousand persons and calculating the percentage of possible coincidences they found the number of coincidences was hundreds of times more numerous than chance could account for professor sidgwick's committee who conducted the investigation therefore signed the following statement apparitions coinciding with death between deaths and apparitions of the dying person a connection exists which is not due to chance alone this we hold as a proved fact there is therefore some definite connection between the two and the task was to ascertain its nature and character the theory was then advanced that inasmuch as telepathy is a fact scientifically proved and inasmuch as figures and images may be transferred from one mind to another by this means the dying person might transfer a vision or image of himself to the mind of some friend or relative so that this person would see not a real outstanding figure but a mental picture or image of him created by the thought of the dying person and conveyed telepathically to the mind of the living friend these telepathic hallucinations as they are called doubtless account for many of the apparitions which are seen at or about the moment of death also for many of those which occur before death and during the lifetime of the individual but how about those which occur after death here we should have to assume that some other process was involved or else extend our belief so as to cover and embrace the action of discarnate spirits phantasms of the dead one theory of these apparitions seen after the death of the person they represent is that they embody the thought of the dead person for example an individual spirit may continue to think over its life and the scenes of its varied activities and these recollections and thoughts influencing the minds of those still living by means of telepathy would cause them to see the phantasmal image of the person thinking the thoughts this however is a question which we shall discuss more fully in the next chapter 
For the present, it may be said that this is one theory advanced to explain so-called phantasms of the dead, or ghosts, as opposed to phantasms of the living and phantasms of the dying. Ghosts that touch. There are many cases of apparitions, however, which cannot be thus easily explained by assuming that they are the projection or telepathic influence of a living mind, or the mind of a discarnate spirit. In many cases, they seem to be real substantial beings, to occupy space and exist as real semi-solid or material phantoms. Those who have been convinced of the reality of an etheric or spiritual body need have no difficulty in assuming that it, it is this body which is seen at such times. And in many cases, we find strong evidence for supposing that a body of this character actually exists. For example, in one historic instance, a doctor and his wife both saw the figure of a woman standing at the foot of their bed, and saw it cross the room and place its fingers over a small nightlight, which was burning on the mantelpiece. At the moment the phantom thus placed his hands over the light, it was extinguished, and the room was left in darkness. Here it is difficult to suppose that any thought creation or telepathic hallucination of any character existed, for the reason that a physical phenomenon was produced, and no hallucination could have done this. Materialized Phantoms Again, in many cases, the phantasmal form or apparition is seen to open doors, lift curtains, raise bedclothes, etc. And in such cases, again, we must assume that a real phantom exists. The problem is thus more complicated than at first appears, and as Mr. Andrew Lang remarked, consequently, if these stories are true, some apparitions are ghosts, real objective entities filling space. Hallucinations cannot draw curtains, or open doors, or cause thumps. Not real thumps. Hallucinatory thumps are different. Dr. Burns tells of a gentleman who, in a dream, pushed against a door in a distant house, so that those in the room were scarcely able to resist the pressure. Now, if this rather staggering anecdote be true, the spirit of a living man being able to affect matter is also, so to speak, material and is an actual entity, an astral body. These arguments then make in favor of the old-fashioned theory of ghosts and wraiths as things objectively existing, rather than the view that all these ghosts are necessarily subjective in origin. Phantasms Created by Thought these phantasms are doubtless thought bodies, in many cases constructed by the operating intelligence itself. One interesting fact in this connection is this, that it is nearly always stated by those who have seen figures of this kind that the phantom is clear and plainly visible about the head and the upper part of the body, but that the apparition dwindles down to a vaporous film toward the feet. In other words, the upper part of the body is much clearer than the lower part. If the phantom were a definite thought creation, this is only what we should expect, for we think of the upper portion of our bodies much more than the lower portion. We are more conscious of our head and shoulders, and the upper portion of the trunk, and the hands and arms and only vaguely conscious of the legs and lower portions of the body. This is exactly what we find in apparitions, and it would therefore seem that the figures are clear in outline just to the extent that the operating intelligence is intensely conscious of the appearance of the body he is creating or building up. Phantoms which impart information. There are also certain cases on record in which the phantom has given the recipient of the experience some important information which he did not know previously, where certain papers are hidden, etc. Such cases certainly prove that an independent intelligence is there, a spirit which is thus manifesting its presence. It must be admitted, however, 
that most apparitions are purposeless and meaningless but this is easily accounted for by supposing that we see at such times not the spirit itself but its mere projected thought a phantom created by the spirit rather than the spirit itself most apparitions are doubtless of this nature we have seen that there are apparitions of the living of the dying and of the dead mostly attached to human beings when they are attached to localities they become local phantoms or cases of haunting of which we shall speak in the next chapter experimental apparitions in addition to these there are so-called cases of experimental apparitions in which an individual succeeds in creating a phantasmal figure at a distance by an effort of will or thought these closely resemble certain cases of self-projection on the one hand and cases of witchcraft on the other and form an intermediary between them since on the one hand they are mere mental pictures and on the other they are real physical entities experimental apparitions then seem to bridge the gulf between these two types of phenomena and form a connecting link apparitions may be induced experimentally by willing very strongly just as you are falling asleep that you will appear to a certain person at a certain time and if this is properly managed it will be successful in a large number of cases this may also be induced experimentally by means of hypnotic suggestion or magnetic or mesmeric processes and when in the trance the spirit of the sleeper may be directed to a certain locality and there seen by those present the natives of west africa claim to be able to do this more or less at will they can project the double or etheric body and so to speak materialize at the other end how to create thought forms the same laws which prevail in many of the previous exercises also rule here the student should see to it that he retains a grasp of his own personality and does not lose control of his inner self at any stage of the proceedings as he progresses in his development along these lines he should endeavor to make the apparition which appears at the other end of the line so to speak more or less solid after he has once succeeded in the process of projection he should throw all his will into the effort to make the projected form more and more substantial and to will that his self-consciousness and activity be actually transferred to the distant scene in this way he is not only seen by others who may happen to be present but is also enabled to see for himself what is actually going on in that place and obtains at the same time a clairvoyant vision of the surroundings in which he has appeared in this way both the psychic and those who perceive the created figure mutually exchange experiences and this process should be continued until the projected double becomes so solid in structure that it cannot be distinguished from a real physical being there are many advanced psychic students who claim that they can actually create and project to great distances material bodies of this nature end of chapter twenty seven Chapter 28 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 28 Haunted Houses. As explained in the last chapter, when apparitions become fixed or attached to one locality, they constitute what is called a local haunting, and the place they influence is commonly called a haunted house. This is the ordinary or common theory of haunted houses, and the average person probably assumes that the figures seen in such houses are material, and the picture he forms of the ghost is that it is a sheeted figure walking about, up and down stairs, and clanking chains after it. There are probably a few, if any, 
psychic students who believe that houses are haunted by figures of this description, and opposed to this view is that of ordinary science, which contends that there are no haunted houses at all, the figures seen within them being merely the product of expectancy, suggestion, and excited imagination. The Explanation of Haunted Houses All those who have carefully investigated the subject, however, come to the conclusion, sooner or later, that there are genuine haunted houses. The question is, what constitutes the haunting, and how are such cases to be explained? Many psychic students have specialized, so to speak, in this subject of haunted houses, and have formulated various theories to explain cases of this character. The following are the most important theories which have been advanced. 1. That one person, or group of persons, forming a family, have experienced certain psychic phenomena in the house in question, and these form the nucleus round which gathered impressions, noises, and psychic experiences of all kinds. From a small beginning great results sprang, elaborated by their own minds. Now when these people moved away from the house in question, and other tenants occupied it, this second group was influenced by the thoughts, emotions, and impressions of those who had moved away, so that they in their turn began to see signs and hear strange sounds, inquiry revealing the fact that the house had the reputation of being haunted, and their own imaginations would magnify the significance of all they had seen or heard. In other words, this theory contends that telepathy, or influence from living minds, is the all-sufficient explanation and alone serves to account for the facts. Telepathy and Psychic Atmosphere 2. The second theory advanced is that telepathy from the dead is the true explanation, the phantom seen, etc., being produced by the influence of minds of deceased persons. On this theory the figures and phantoms are not objective or real, any more than in the first case, but are telepathic hallucinations, just as truly, though they have an objective basis of reality, inasmuch as they have originated in the mind of a deceased person. Dreams or thoughts of the dead constitute, therefore, the basic principle of explanation on this theory. 3. The next theory which is advanced is that some subtle psychic atmosphere permeates the walls of the house in question, and that this atmosphere influences or impresses all those who live within it. There is much to say in favor of such a theory, and the previous chapters on the aura, psychometry, the human fluid, etc., will lend a certain amount of support to it. At the same time, it is difficult to see how a general and impersonal atmosphere of this character could translate itself into definite figures or forms, particularly when these speak and convey information unknown to the seer. I shall say more of this later. Astral Bodies and Thought Forms 4. The fourth theory to be advanced is that the figures seen are the astral or etheric bodies of spirits who return and constitute the haunting, being present in actual fact. This is the nearest approach to the commonly held theory of the figures seen in haunted houses. 5. The fifth theory is that such figures are thought forms, created by some distant, living or disincarnate mind, and projected into the house in question, where they assume more or less definite and tangible form. This is, in a sense, a process of self-projection, but the phantasm is always seen in a certain place, as though magnetically drawn to that locality. The Nature of the Figure Seen Which of these theories is the correct one? In my own estimation there is much truth in all of them, and no two cases of haunted houses are due to the same cause, or depend upon the same conditions. All five of these causes may be operating at the same time in any one house, or any two, three, or four of them may be. Indeed, to judge from the complex nature of the phenomena seen, it is highly probable that such is the case. There is strong evidence, in fact, to make us believe that the ordinary hallucination theories will not serve to explain the facts. For example, these phantasms often produce physical phenomena, as before explained, such as opening doors, lifting curtains, snuffing candles, etc. Mental images or pictures could not do this. Again, animals often see, or appear to see, apparitions in haunted houses, and show all the signs of fear such as trembling, sweating, etc. In the third place, figures are often described differently by different individuals. For example, A would describe a full-face view of the figure, while B would describe the figure in profile. If a real figure were standing where both percipients saw it, this description would be correct. 
such cases certainly tend to suggest that a real figure and no mere hallucination was present in the fourth place apparitions have been seen by two three or more persons at once these collective hallucinations as they are called strongly suggest an external phantom and no mere mental picture proofs of reality in the fifth place apparitions which have appeared to strangers occupying haunted houses have afterwards been identified on being shown the photograph of the person for example a gentleman sleeping in a house reputed to be haunted sees a certain figure bending over him when he awakes at midnight he notes details of dress feature etc and also notes that he has never seen this person before in his life the next day he is shown twenty photographs from among the twenty he selects one as being the phantom seen in the house the owner of the house then tells him that this is the person said to haunt the locality in question again we are driven to believe that more than mere hallucination is at work in the sixth place these figures seen in haunted houses have occasionally been photographed and this objective and physical proof of their reality is strong evidence that they are more than mental products seventh figures seen in haunted houses often convey to the seer definite information or give messages which the individual in question could not have known this strongly indicates not only the reality of the apparition but the fact that it is a disincarnate spirit for these reasons therefore we must assume that haunted houses are actual realities and that the figures seen therein are at times at least outstanding entities and represent more or less directly the individual they appear to portray seances in haunted houses psychic students can test their power and at the same time conduct many interesting and valuable experiments in haunted houses in an atmosphere of this sort which is more highly charged with magnetism than the ordinary seance room psychic powers of any character should be quickly augmented and increased so that messages could be obtained by speech vision automatic writing crystal vision etc whenever you hear of a case of a haunted house therefore you should make it a point to visit this house at once it is not necessary to sleep in it a night as many suppose in order to test its character hold a seance in that house in the evening and striking phenomena will probably result or if you cannot gather together a group of interested students sit by yourself and see whether you cannot obtain direct messages from the intelligences present experiments in automatic writing crystal gazing etc may also be tried clairvoyant diagnosis of haunted houses clairvoyance may also render useful service by visiting clairvoyantly haunted houses and ascertaining and describing if possible the source and cause of the haunting visit the house by means of a clairvoyant excursion either spontaneously or when in a mesmeric trance etc and use your psychic powers to the utmost to discover what you can regarding this house when you find yourself inside it look about and see whether you can sense any spirits evil or otherwise lurking among its atmosphere endeavor to sense the psychic atmosphere of the house and test the aura of those living within it all houses reputed to be haunted may not necessarily be so but the individuals themselves may be unbalanced or obsessed for some reason in which case the house itself would be free except from those influences which were drawn to it by the individuals residing there many persons living in haunted houses wish to be free from the depressing influences which sometimes hang about houses of this character yet do not know how to proceed in order to rid themselves of these haunting presences this is a very complicated question and one to which psychic students have in the past given far too little attention in my book the coming science there is a chapter entitled haunted houses and their cure and i would refer all those interested to the work in question an interesting case is there given of a haunted house which was cured so to say by the following means how to cure haunted houses a trance medium georgia gladys cooley was called in to investigate and do what she could and when in the house went spontaneously into trance in that condition her guide spoke through her and described the haunting spirits they were then charged to remove them if possible and undertook to do so this they did in a somewhat striking and dramatic manner and ended by reporting the fact that the haunting presences had been finally completely removed this is a very instructive case and shows us that trans mediums and their guides can be of a very great service in many cases where the haunting assumes an unpleasant or evil character thus the nature of the haunting may be diagnosed clairvoyantly and the cure effected through some trans medium and by the spirits who operate through him in some cases however the haunting may be cured by more simple means such as suggestion lessening the psychic sensitiveness of those living in the house by diverting the thoughts 
by plenty of outdoor, physical exercise, toughening the aura, etc. On the other hand, there are cases on record where haunted houses have withstood all attempts to cure them, and the inhabitants have ultimately been forced to move. Happily, cases of this character are rare. At all events, haunted houses present a fascinating and useful field, in which the psychic student can test his clairvoyance, or other psychic power, to advantage. End of chapter 28 Recording by Amanda Friday Chapter 29 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington Chapter 29 The Difficulties of Communication The process of communication is doubtless far more difficult and complicated than the average person believes, and is even more complicated than most spiritualists believe. As stated in a previous chapter, one of the great objections to the reality of spiritualism urged in the past is that, if true, many more persons must communicate than now appear to do so, and that of the thousands who die, more must come back than the few who return through mediums. It was there pointed out that the reason for this consists partly in the fact that, quote, good communicators, unquote, are comparatively rare, and that there is necessarily a peculiar psychical condition which enables them to communicate through mediums. In addition to this, a medium must be present at the time that an effort to communicate is being made, and in many cases the recipient of the message must also be reaching out to receive it before it can be given satisfactorily. In other words, the sender and the receiver of the message must stretch out their, quote, mental arms, unquote, so to say, at the same moment before they can shake hands across the great gulf, and if only one does so, he fails to reach the one on the other side. Factors Affecting Communication It has frequently been pointed out by scientific investigators of spiritualism that only after the reality of the facts has been proved does their detailed study begin. For example, supposing that a spirit can write through an entranced medium, she giving the messages in automatic writing. The fact once admitted the scientific study of the case will only have begun, and such questions as these would then have to be answered. To what extent is the medium's spirit disconnected from the body while the communication is taking place? What is the degree of mental activity of the medium's spirit during the communication? Does the communicating intelligence act directly on the brain and nervous centers of the medium, or in a more roundabout manner? and if the former, upon what brain centers does the intelligence act, and how? If a communicator was in life a good visualizer, or had a good memory, etc., would these factors assist him in the process of communication, and if so, how? These and many similar questions would have to be answered, and it is upon questions such as these that many psychical researchers have bent their energies for some time past it is probable that several hundred years will have to elapse before these questions can be answered fully and the facts explained in detail. Difficulties of the Communicating Spirit Let us enumerate some of the difficulties which a communicating spirit probably has to contend with in sending messages through mediums to the living. There is much evidence to show that the process of communication is a very difficult one, for as soon as a spirit gets in contact with the medium and begins to transmit messages, he becomes more or less exhausted and suffocated, so to speak, by the dense aura or atmosphere with which he is called upon to come into contact. In many instances, we read that spirits have to go away several times during the course of a seance to revive themselves and afterwards return refreshed and clear-brained to continue the communications. They experience great difficulty in holding their thoughts together, connectedly, during the process of communication. 
this does not mean that they are ordinarily in this confused state but very often as soon as they come into contact with the medium's psychic atmosphere and magnetism they become confused and their minds tend to wander as they would in delirium or in a state of trance it is because of this that many of the messages we receive commence well but afterwards dwindle off into incoherence and triviality why many messages are quote, trivial unquote. this question of quote, triviality unquote, however is often misunderstood the objection is raised that spirits if they really communicate would tell us something more important than they usually do as a matter of fact however this is only true in a certain sense the ordinary social conversation between quote, spirits in the flesh unquote, is not as serious as it might be and it has been shown by actual experiment that human beings when called upon to prove their own identity to another do deliberately choose trivial incidents by means of which to identify themselves another point is that trivial incidents serve best to prove identity as some great philosophical discourse might be given by any intelligence either in or out of the body and would prove nothing to one longing to hear from his own dear one in such a case personal detailed and so to say trivial messages are often the most striking and the most convincing the very triviality of many messages received through mediums is therefore their strongest point and not their weakest in addition to this there are as we know innumerable books written by spirits containing philosophical scientific and religious truths of great value and importance influence of the medium's organism another reason why communication is doubtless difficult is that the communicating spirit is unused to the bodily organism of the medium all of us have certain mental and physical habits which we form and it is easier for us to do certain things in certain ways after we have done them in that manner a few times if you were suddenly transplanted into the body of another person say one of the opposite sex you would find great difficulty in manipulating that body so as to extract from it the best results to think clearly and to speak and write clearly when expressing your thoughts it is precisely this difficulty which the communicating intelligence experiences in trying to communicate with us through unfamiliar bodies many of the habits and quote, tricks unquote, so to say of the medium creep into the messages which are consequently often more or less similar to the language employed by the medium this proves only that the spirit has to employ the medium's mental and bodily habits as best it can during the process of communication and that it is not as easy and concise as many persons imagine symbolism necessary another difficulty presented is that the conditions on the quote, other side unquote, are doubtless so different from any which exist here that they have to be explained in roundabout and symbolic language if you had to explain color to a blind man you would find great difficulty in doing so if you had to explain the feelings experienced while giving psychometric tests to one who had never experienced them you would also find considerable difficulty it is much the same in this case there are no immediate analogies which can be drawn and the result is that symbolism and a language which appears to us vague and unsatisfactory is often employed in describing the other side of life and the conditions which prevail therein difficulties of names and dates names and dates furnish great difficulty for returning spirits dates because of the fact that time is not recognized by them in the same way that it is with us names for the reason that they do not represent concrete pictures or meanings but are as a rule only a combination of letters having a certain sound the word quote, chair unquote, calls up to the mind a certain picture which can be visualized on the other hand the name quote, robinson unquote, calls up no such picture except perhaps the memory image of some friend of yours by that name if that memory picture is revived in the communicator's mind the medium can see this and describe it which is precisely what he does 
but the name quote, robinson unquote, cannot be presented in picture form the most common form of representation and consequently is not easily communicated as explained in the chapter on dreams our hearing centers are less developed than our sight centers and for this reason verbal messages are less easily given and received than pictured or visualized messages the difficulty in receiving names is explained largely because of this fact communications immediately after death for some days after death these difficulties are particularly great and especially in the case of suicides dr hodgson in his report of the case of mrs piper says quote, that persons just deceased should be extremely confused and unable to communicate directly or even at all seems perfectly natural after the shock and wrench of death thus in one case the spirit was unable to write the second day after his death in another case a friend of mine whom i may call d wrote with what appeared to be much difficulty his name and the words i am all right adieu within two or three days after his death in another case f he was unable to write on the morning after his death. A few days later, when a stranger was present with me for a sitting, he wrote two or three sentences, saying, I am too weak to articulate clearly. And not many days later, he wrote fairly well and quite accurately, dictating also to Madame Eliza the amanuensis, an account of his feelings when finding himself amid new surroundings. Both D and F became very clear in a short time. D communicated frequently, later on, both by writing and speech. End quote. Other difficulties. Other difficulties remain, such as the probable inability of the communicating spirit to see the material world as we see it, especially at the time of communication. The difficulty of holding the mind together while communicating the difficulty of manipulating the medium's organism and the intracosmic difficulties which exist between this world and the next because of all these hindrances and impediments spirits find great difficulty in direct communication and because of these facts messages are comparatively speaking few and in so many cases inconclusive when a good medium a good communicator and a sympathetic sitter get together however very striking and convincing results are obtained, as we know from the history of spiritualism. End of chapter 29。Chapter 30 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hare Uward Carrington. Chapter 30 Hypnotism and Mesmerism. The word mesmerism is derived from Antoine Mesire, who founded the system and who performed all the early experiments in this field. It was known as mesmerism for about 50 years until an English physician by the name of Dr. James Braid coined a new word, hypnotism, from the Greek hypnos, sleep, and this is the word which has been used almost exclusively from that date to this. The difference between hypnotism and mesmerism the majority of persons would claim at the present day that hypnotism and mesmerism are identical, there being no difference between them. They are both due, it is said, to suggestion and the influence of the mind over the body. Very similar phenomena occur in both cases. It is true, but I believe that there is a difference between the two processes and conditions. Mesmerism is based on the belief that there is a definite physical emanation or vital fluid which passes from the operator into the subject while the mesmeric passes are being made over the latter's body hypnotism on the other hand 
is due entirely to suggestion. The influence of the subconscious mind upon the body. There is no physical influence or effluence in hypnotic practice, and it is claimed that all the phenomena of mesmerism, apparently showing such influence, are in reality entirely due to suggestion. As before stated, however, we believe that there is a difference between the two processes and that hypnotism is due solely to physical causes, but that in mesmerism the human fluid before spoken of plays a part. As proof of this, I may cite, among other proofs, the fact that clairvoyance and many of the so-called higher phenomena are frequently obtained in mesmeric trance, while there are extremely rare in hypnotic trance, other phenomena could be mentioned, but this will suffice for the present. Mesmerism, being due to the passage of a vital fluid from the body of the operator into the subject, contact and passes are essential. If, therefore, you wish to mesmerize your subject, you should make passes over his head, forehead, eyes, and down the front of the body. All downward passes are sleep passes, and all upward passes are walking passes. Placing the hands on certain nerve centers of the forehead, and particularly between the eyes and over the temples, will help to induce sleep. Also, clasping the patient's hands and placing the point of your thumb in contact with the point of his thumb establishes the current and serves to induce the mesmeric trance. In hypnotism, on the other hand, passes are not essential, though often help. In hypnotizing a subject, it is common to ask him, first of all, to gaze at a bright object until his eyes tire. When the lids are closed, suggestions of sleep are given, or the subject may open and close the eyes a number of times as you count, and this will serve to induce the initial stages of hypnotic trance. The deeper stages are induced by means of suggestion. Post-hypnotic suggestion is a form of treatment often resorted to and is a good subject for experimentation. It means that the subject performs after awaking from trance, certain actions suggested to him when entranced. He remembers nothing of the suggestions, but carries them out to the letter. Many hypnotic subjects have extraordinary ability in calculating time, and can guess to a second the length of time which has elapsed between certain intervals or carry out post-hypnotically a suggestion given them in trance days, or even weeks before. Hypnotism is a useful method of opening up and exploring the subconscious mind. We are enabled to tap it, as it were, and get in touch with hidden portions of our being, which we could otherwise never reach. Dreams may be analyzed in this manner. Also, unpleasant thoughts, impressions, emotions, etc., removed and frequently undesirable influences banished by hypnotic suggestion. Hypnotism seems to reach a deeper stratum of our mind than ordinary waking suggestion. And because of this fact, it is at times so useful. For instance, the drink habit has often been cured by hypnotic suggestion. Hence, we see that there must be more in the hypnotic command than mere advice or persuasion because of thousands of drunkards have been advised not to drink, but they continue to do so. Nevertheless, by means of hypnotism, we are enabled to reach a portion of the mind so deep that it controls the whole being. And the result is that these deep-rooted habits may at times be removed and eradicated. This is one of the distinguishing marks of the hypnotic state that a more fundamental control over the body and mind is obtained. And by reason of this fact, many cures of diseased conditions and abnormal states of mind have been recorded, which have been otherwise treated ineffectively. There is a difference between the hypnotic 
and the mediumistic trance, though not so great as that existing between the latter and the mesmeric state. In both, the mediumistic and the mesmeric trance, a form of magnetism is doubtless employed, and this connects them in a subtle bond of union. It is because of this that telepathy, clairvoyance, etc., are so often obtained in the mesmeric trance, which is closely akin to the condition secured by mediums in which they obtain genuine mediumistic messages. The Fear of Being Hypnotized Many persons are afraid of being hypnotized, this fear being based partly upon valid reasons and partly upon superstition. Properly induced by an expert, the hypnotic trance is not injurious. On the contrary, it is often extremely beneficial and, as before pointed out, quickens the mental and physical powers, removes bad habits, effects cures, etc. On the other hand, when hypnotism is applied by an ignorant or bungling operator who does not know his business, the result may be very detrimental to the health of the person hypnotized. A state may be induced which neither the operator nor anybody else fully understands. For no one at the present time fully comprehends the nature of the condition, thereby induced. The conscious mind is removed from its supremacy and that this is often a fatal mistake, particularly when there are evil influences at work, either within or without the subject. If the operator is a sympathetic, careful, and qualified expert, mesmerism may prove highly beneficial for evil influences, may thereby be removed. By counteracting them and infusing into the subject a supply of beneficial animal magnetism, which is opposed to that supplied from opposite sources. Hypnotic influence from other minds. Andrew Jackson Davis began his career as a medium by being mesmerized, and others could doubtless develop their mediumistic faculties in the same way. But one must be extremely careful in such a case to select a thoroughly competent operator, one in whom he has complete faith, otherwise more harm than good may result. If you find that any one is trying to influence you against your will, you may overcome this by a counter-suggestion, given to yourself from within. If the person be absent, this may be purely imaginary on your part, and the operator in question may be entirely ignorant of the effect he is producing in you. There are thousands of persons in insane asylums all over the world who suffer from the belief that they are being persecuted by others at a distance, and that these others are endeavoring to influence them by hypnotism, etc. As a matter of fact, nothing of the sort is the case, and their condition is purely the result of imaginary belief. Be most careful, therefore, that you fully ascertain and prove to your satisfaction the existence of this foreign influence before you take any steps to offset it or even seriously believe that such influence is being directed towards you. How to Overcome Such Influences When once you have become satisfied that influences of this character are being directed towards you, take immediate steps to protect yourself, such as those outlined in Chapter 23, Obsession and Insanity. If promptly applied, this will effectively offset such conditions coming from outside minds. If you are in the presence of a person whom you feel to be influencing you, it would then be best to take the precautions and steps outlined in the next chapter, devoted to personal magnetism. This will prevent your passing under the influence of such a person. You need never fear that hypnotic sleep, even if induced, will last a great length of time, and that the subject cannot be awakened therefrom. Sleeps of this character always terminate spontaneously, if they are let alone, though it is always best to see that a hypnotic subject is thoroughly awakened before he leaves the care and supervision of the operator. Otherwise, he may go about in a somewhat dazed condition for a time and may not be altogether responsible for his actions. An important warning. Somnambulism is a variation of hypnotic sleep where the subject 
spontaneously performs a number of complicated actions, and the subconscious muscular activities play a large part. A person who is subject to somnambulistic attacks should never under any circumstances be awakened suddenly. It is a good plan to speak to such a person and suggest to him, as to one in hypnotic trance, that he return to bed and, this done, suggest to him that it is impossible for such a condition to again occur, etc. Somnambulistic attacks of this character may often be cured by hypnotic treatment and properly directed suggestion. Prevention of Hypnotic Influence An operator may prevent his subject from being hypnotized by any other person through forceful suggestions to his subject that he will be enabled to resist suggestions from any other operator, that he will have no effect on him, etc. If you do not wish to be hypnotized at all, you may give similar suggestions to yourself. These self-suggestions are called auto-suggestions. Lightly given and persistently repeated, they will effectively prevent you from being influenced by any other person. End of chapter 30. Recording by John Smith. Chapter 31 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olenka. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Personal Magnetism. We all know the difference between a positive and a negative personality between an individual who is naturally successful and one who is not. The former seems to attract to himself success, happiness and prosperity. The latter seems to repel it. It's not necessary for a naturally positive person to say anything or to perform any action in order to make us feel this power within him. It seems to radiate silently from him as a form of power. Many times, doubtless, we have all stepped into a room an elevator, etc., and immediately felt the strong personality and presence of an individual of this character, possessing much natural magnetism. They may know nothing of this power, perhaps hardly realize that they possess it, although they do, in many cases to a remarkable degree. Properly developed and utilized, this power helped to make the great names in history. We may, all of us, cultivate and develop this power to a great extent by proper practice and the degree to which we can develop it will make us successful accordingly, not only in the material things of this world, but will also enable us to achieve mental and spiritual heights which the ordinary person cannot attain. The inexhaustible supply. We must constantly bear in mind that there is an unlimited supply of cosmic energy and this will develop personal magnetism to the degree to which we can draw upon it. Exercises for doing so have been given in a previous chapter. We must have confidence in ourselves and in our powers, for confidence in self breeds confidence in others, and fear weakens both the brain that plans and the hand that executes. We must use suggestion rightly in our conversation with others, and without appearing to do so, constantly give such suggestions as are likely to take root in the mind, and this must be hammered in by constant repetition. Finally, we must not waste the magnetism we may possess by nervous habits, such as tapping on the floor or table with the fingers, pacing up and down the room, etc. In short, all unnecessary gestures. If we save our energy in this way, it is the same as if we received more of it, and this we can utilize to good account. The physical factor. Personal magnetism depends upon various factors. First of all, sound physical health is essential. Without it, there is little virility, and upon the presence of this vital stamina, success largely depends. Theodore Roosevelt's dominating personality was due largely to his extraordinary physical energy. Large muscles are not necessarily a sign of this. It is the vital constitution which must be strengthened, and in order to accomplish this, the internal organs must be in a healthy condition. Proper exercises devoted to stimulating their function should be taken for a few minutes daily, and in this connection the student would do well to consult one or two good books on physical culture, giving directions of this character. Bending movement of all kinds are especially helpful. 
Deep breathing exercises, which tend to expand the lungs, chest and diaphragm, are to be recommended. And if you can stimulate the solar plexus and internal organs by deep breathing exercises, this will go a long way towards rousing the vital currents of the body. The inner physical causes for this will be explained more fully in subsequent chapters. The mental factor. Next, the mind must be trained and cultivated in certain directions and channels. Just here, the student would do well to turn back and reread the directions given in Chapter 7, Self and Soul Culture, where practical advice on success and its attainment is given. The practice of concentration, Chapter 24, would prove very helpful here. Relaxation both of body and mind should follow this. The improvement of memory by various methods would greatly add to the strength of the psychic personality, since it is upon memory that the thread of personality depends. Attention upon any given subject should be cultivated, and you should never allow yourself to perform any action automatically which should be conscious. For instance, if you put an object in the drawer of your desk, make a conscious mental note of this at the time, so that you afterward remember where it is placed, and never allow yourself to place the object there without paying particular attention to it. Many people do this, and it is indicative of a weak power of attention and a scattered mind. The degree to which you can overcome this indicates concentration and hence power. Nothing gives power and strength to the mind so much as continued exercise and concentration. The spiritual factor. Spiritual development will also assist in the cultivation of personal magnetism by drawing to your aid certain spiritual energies which recharge you, that is, charge your body in much the same way that an electric motor is charged by external energy. This power you draw by placing yourself in a certain receptive condition which invites its influx. All negative thoughts tend to erect a wall between yourself and helpful external guidance. And on the other hand, an affirmative and positive attitude will have the effect of attracting or drawing to you this additional power. Thoughts and emotions also have this effect. If you will carefully analyze your own inner sensations while thinking certain thoughts or experiencing certain emotions, you will find that selfish, self-centered impulses tend to contract you mentally and physically. You feel yourself tightening up all over, as it were, and this internal action shuts off all outside aid and influence. On the other hand, if you think thoughts of friendship, love, etc., you will find your beings tends to expand and it is this feeling which opens the gates of your soul to an influx of higher power. How to influence others. Personal magnetism is practically useful in the affairs of this life. If you wish to achieve a certain object, you will far more likely to do so if you have a good magnetic personality than otherwise. The following simple rules, if followed, will probably greatly assist you in the development of personal magnetism. 1. Just before entering into the presence of the person whom you're about to interview, call up that person's image before your mind and assume toward it a positive mental attitude. If you do this, you will carry over and maintain this attitude towards that person when you meet him. If you assume at the outset 60 or 75% of the mental dominance or initiative, you, figuratively speaking, only leave the other person 40 or 25% of the ground lying between you which he can possibly occupy. Your business is to assume, at the outset, as large a percentage of the positive relationship as possible, and by doing so you force the other person to assume the minor quantity. The use of the eyes, too. When in the presence of the person whom you are to interview, look him squarely in the eyes and hold his gaze and attention until you have won your first point. If possible, do not allow his attention or his eyes to wander from you until you have thoroughly ensured his interest and sympathetic cooperation. It is important to catch the eye at the moment you are making a particular point, so as to drive it home, as it were. You cannot stare a person in the eye all the while you are talking to him, and you should look away part of the time, when you are discussing unimportant points or leading up to the climax. Many salesmen utilize this principle in making a sale. They will draw attention to a book or an illustration at which they ask you to look and talk about it for a moment. Then close the book and make a short, quick remark which will draw your attention to his face and eyes spontaneously. At the moment when he has gained your full attention and you are in a condition to receive any statement he will make to you, he will come to the climax of his argument 
and perhaps ask you to sign a certain paper, which you may be prevailed upon to do, under the influence of his personality. How to develop the magnetic gaze. The eyes, therefore, play an important part in the cultivation of personal magnetism, and you should cultivate and strengthen them by certain exercises which will certainly develop them. For example, practice gazing steadily at an object for several seconds without allowing the gaze or the attention to wander and without blinking the eyes. At first you will probably be able to do so for only a short time, but this will gradually be extended as you cultivate the power. Next, practice gazing at a fairly bright object and continue this until you can look at it for several minutes at a time without becoming affected. When you look into the eyes of another person, do not look blankly, but will at the same time and throw the whole force of your personality into your gaze, feeling that you will influence that person to do as you wish. Naturally, practices of this character can be, and in fact are, utilized by many persons for evil as well as for good purposes. Those who are endeavoring to cultivate the higher side of their nature, however, will fully realize the necessity of utilizing any added powers they may gain for good purposes only. Passes and Suggestions 3. Downward passes, as before explained, are sleep passes and a few of these will add emphasis to your speech and impress the person to whom you are talking. Do not gesticulate over much, however, as this will detract rather than add to what you have to say. A few passes at the proper moments will prove of great value. 4. Do not speak hurriedly, for if you do you will give the impression that you are in a hurry, and your hearer will unconsciously grow impatient. On the other hand, do not drawl your words but speak naturally with a clear, forceful enunciation. The more reposeful and calm you appear, the more receptive your listener will be to hear what you have to say. At the same time, you must be businesslike and precise. How to prevent the influence of others. If you wish to offset the influence of someone who is speaking to you and prevent yourself from being influenced by him, you should see to it that you do not allow him to catch your eye at the psychological climax of the conversation, but studiously look away at that time and carefully think over and analyse what he is saying to you without allowing yourself to be swayed by his manner or words. Look at him in the intervals between these climaxes when he will probably be looking away from you. Hold your mind in a positive attitude and never allow yourself to be hurried into anything. The ability to say no and stick to it when occasion demands has been declared one of the greatest essentials to success by many men who have attained great eminence. As Abraham Lincoln once remarked, be sure you are right and then go ahead. A clear mind and inner mental repose will greatly add to your power in these directions. Helpful application. These exercises in the development of personal magnetism will be found especially helpful to all psychics for the reason that they tend to offset and counterbalance to a great extent the subjective practices of mediumship and hence balance up the personality by accentuating the objective as well as the subjective side of one's inner self. All those who are developing psychic powers and mediumship should, therefore, while leading their daily lives, endeavour to follow the principles herein laid down and develop their own natures along these lines. They will find that it will prove very helpful to them and preserve that just balance we term health. End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Phelps Gonzalez. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Carrington. Chapter 32 Prophecy versus Fortune Telling. The subject with which this chapter deals is a very important one for the spiritualist, for the psychic, and above all for the public medium, for the reason that it concerns him in a very practical manner. It would seem as if spiritualism, although an organized religious body, international in scope and influence, had no standing in the eyes of some people, nor that its accredited mediums were entitled to any more consideration than ordinary fortune-tellers. 
Fortune telling, so called, is against the law, and in many cities the authorities are very severe on anything which can in any way be construed as fortune telling. Truly, one may be pardoned for believing that there is a power back of it which is opposed to so called modernisms, to the several movements of a spiritual and religious nature that are freshly putting forth real knowledge of our true relations to this life and the life beyond. It is not merely a moral wave not merely ignorance of the difference between true and honest mediumship and fortune-telling, but an effort to retard and crush the truth. From the present standpoint of the court, Jesus, when he told the woman at the well about certain manners in her life, was a fortune-teller. The people marveled over him because of what he could tell and do. To spiritualists, he was a medium, but a master, and one so qualified by time and distance as he comes down the centuries to the present age. In the 21st chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes the gifts of the Spirit, or spiritual gifts, and says they are all of the same Spirit. The word Spirit here is used in the sense of a collective noun or a noun of multitude, much as we use the word Congress, and applies to the Spirit world as the source of inspiration and control, the same as with the spiritualist. Mediums and the Law there was much consulting with mediums in those early days of the primitive church. For does not Paul again say, Try the spirits and see if they be of God. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Opposition stirs up opposition and puts men and movements on the defensive. Spiritualism realizes this and is now actively engaged in efforts for the better protection of its mediums. When one strikes a blow at modern spiritualism, he strikes a blow as well at ancient spiritual truth, that truth which fills the pages of our Bible, for which the early martyrs died and upon which the Christian church was built. It comes as the comforter which Jesus said he would send in the latter days. An assistant district attorney once made a ruling that a sandwich constitutes a meal, and so liquor could be bought on Sunday. But no court can rule that a fortune teller constitutes a spiritualistic medium and have it stand. The letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. At the same time, prophecy is a genuine spiritual or mediumistic gift, and there are thousands of persons who have experienced so-called premonitions or provisions of the future and have felt compelled to tell others what they have seen for them. Between prophecy and fortune-telling there is, therefore, a very fine line to be drawn, for the one is dependent upon superstition to a great extent, while the other is a genuine psychical faculty which requires our recognition and study. What prophecy is? So far as we can define the distinction between the two, it may be said that prophecy depends upon internal spiritual promptings, or the reception of definite messages relating to the future which are told the medium by external spiritual intelligences. He acts merely as a medium for transmission in the latter case, and simply gives out what he receives. This is the type of spiritual premonition as distinct from clairvoyance of the future which we have already discussed in chapter 14. In this latter case, the power appears to depend upon internal and spontaneous quickening of spiritual faculties, and seems to be self-originated, as it were. It is very similar to spontaneous premonitions, therefore, and in fact these subjects are so very closely connected that only an expert can define the differences between them. Unless one has had considerable experience and knowledge in this field, he is totally incapable of judging whether a given set of phenomena are the type of genuine prophecy or mere fortune-telling, and he should study the subject thoroughly before he is capable of expressing an opinion upon it. It may be well to consider the meaning of the word prophecy. It is derived from the Greek word prophemai, pro meaning before, and femai to say or tell. There is another word propheteuo of similar import and derivation, and means to prophecy, divine, foretell, predict, presage, to explain or apply prophecies. In Greek classical literature, the word prophet meant a declarer, foreteller, diviner, a harbinger, a forerunner, a priest, teacher, instructor, interpreter, a poet, a bard. All of these definitions carry with them something of the idea of a character whose mission is in some way connected with the aspirations and longings of mankind. A Definition of Prophecy The Standard Dictionary has defined prophecy as follows. 1. To predict or foretell, especially under divine inspiration and guidance. To prefigure, as to prophecy evil. 2. To speak or utter for God. 
3. To speak by divine influence or as a medium of communication between God and man. Specifically, to speak to men for God, declare or interpret the divine will. 4. To predict future events by supernatural influence, real or professed. To foretell the future. Utter predictions as to prophecy a disaster. 5. Archaic. To interpret scripture, explain religious subjects, preach, exhort. Under the head of synonyms, the standard dictionary gives augur, define, foretell, predict, prognosticate. Prophecy differs from predict by assuming a claim to supernatural or divine inspirations. To prognosticate is to predict from observed signs, indications, or conditions. To prophecy in the scriptural sense is to utter religious truths under divine inspiration, not simply always to foretell future events, but to warn, exhort, comfort, etc. by special message or impulse from God. This scriptural definition seems well adapted to the spiritualist sense of the word when we interpret God to mean the infinite spirit of good. The verb prophecy is also used in the New Testament in the sense of revealing something which had happened and was unknown to the person revealing it, except through some so-called supernatural source. As, for instance, after Jesus was pronounced guilty of death by the high priest, some of the ruffians, who have their counterpart in this day, spat in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Matthew chapter 26, verse 65 to 68. Jesus ignored this challenge. Could they have understood or would they have believed in his mission if he had correctly pointed out the man who had assaulted him? Explanation of Fortune Telling It is true, however, that the method of arriving at the knowledge given is, in itself, an indication of the character of the knowledge imparted. Thus, fortune-telling in the hands of charlatans and quacks is often connected with such superstitious practices as reading the future from tea or coffee grounds, from cards, allowing birds to pick out envelopes containing written messages relating to the future, etc. Such practices are certainly to be deprecated by every sincere spiritualist and truth-seeker, though it should be said just here that many psychics who read the cards in this manner depend not so much on the actual fall of the cards as upon the psychic impressions which they receive at the time the sitter's fortune is being told. This is often true also in the case of palmists. There is doubtless some truth to the general doctrine of palmistry, but it can only hold good to a very limited extent. When impressions are received, the process is somewhat akin to crystal gazing, where the mind is concentrated on an external object while it remains passive and open to internal impressions. But instead of receiving these in the form of visual pictures, they are given in a more general and vague manner. Why fortune-telling is sometimes true On the other hand, genuine mediumistic messages are frequently given while the subject is reading the cards, examining the sitter's palm, etc., it will be observed that, in these cases, there is a certain fundamental reality in the phenomena, but it is perverted and unconsciously covered up by the seer who is unaware of the actual source of the information he gives. Psychic power or mediumship is the basis of the supernormal information given, but it is under the guise of fortune-telling. A far more direct and satisfactory method would be to come out in a straightforward and direct manner and state that each and such impressions were received relating to the future, and this premonitory faculty could doubtless be cultivated by certain practices and be used as the student progressed in his psychic development. Exercises for development of these faculties will be given later on in this book. Why Mediums Cannot Help Themselves Disbelievers in spiritualism often say, If your assertions are true, why do not the spirits warn and advise you more frequently, and why do they not help you financially or otherwise more than they do? The answer is simply, as before said, that you are not a creator, but an instrument. A knife may be sharp, but it could not cut bread without the power behind it. A soldier may go to war and fight bravely without knowing the real reasons for the war. You are the knife or the soldier. You cannot act by yourself or achieve desirable results unless the power be imparted to you from beyond, and even then the power is supplied for other purposes and centered upon other things. The knife does not cut itself, but the bread. Clairvoyant power does not benefit the clairvoyant directly, but some third person. 
and in cases where the student has found it possible to pervert its use and turn it into selfish channels, the power has invariably been lost. It may also be said that spiritualists may err in the selection of spirit advisors as well in their mediums of intercommunication. That is true, for we are not endowed with perfect judgment, even in selecting in this life our medical or legal advisors, or our governmental representatives and officials, our business partners or our friends, or the person to advise us as to where we can get the best advice in a given manner. The spiritualist merely claims the right to act for himself, without let or hindrance from those who differ with him in religious views. If he makes mistakes which cause him loss or suffering, it must be remembered that even Jesus, with his extraordinary psychic powers, made a mistake when he selected Judas Iscariot as one of the twelve. If it be said that this seeming mistake was a part of the divine plan, then it may also be said that the spiritualist's seeming mistakes may also be part of a divine plan. History of Prophecy there can be no doubt that prophecy has existed in all ages and has had its own uses as well as its abuses. Many spiritualists believe that prophecy is invariably connected with spirits and that the explanation depends upon their communication. On the other hand, many orthodox religious persons believe that prophecy depends entirely upon the influx of the divine spirit and that the ability to predict or foretell comes directly from God. This is the manner in which it is regarded by many people and many religious books. There are many references to prophecy and to prophets both in the Old and the New Testament, and anyone who accepts the teachings of the Bible as in any way true and valuable can hardly fail to believe that prophecy is a genuine psychical faculty which has been exercised by men in all ages and is undoubtedly being exercised by them now. Thus, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, we read, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Again, in the same chapter, verse 1, we read, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And again, in the same chapter, verses 31, 32, and 39, we read, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. One more quotation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4-12, through 12, we read, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernings of Spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, abiding in every man as he will. Many other references of this character could be given, but it is hardly necessary, for every student knows that every religious book in the world accepts the genuineness of prophecy and, in fact, all religions are based on the revelations of seers or prophets. How is prophecy possible? Prophecy is a faculty which usually comes unsought and spontaneously. When the future is seen in an isolated picture or event, it is usually called a premonition or prevision, and many examples of this character have been collected and published by the Societies for Psychical Research. It may be asked, how is it possible to see into the future, to lift the veil of futurity and glance forward as we glance backward in reading history? Certainly, at first sight, such a thing appears not only impossible but absurd. Nevertheless, it is an undoubted fact, and numbers of cases of this character might perhaps be explained more or less rationally, even with our present knowledge. Thus, certain types of premonitions relate to the future of welfare of the body or health of the subject experiencing them. In such cases, we might suppose that the subconscious mind, which has a wider range of inner experience and knowledge than the ordinary waking mind, was aware of certain internal changes and happenings of which the conscious mind was totally ignorant. 
In such cases, the explanation would be that this subconscious mind, having acquired this knowledge, would merely impart or externalize it in the form of a vision, voice, or message, or in the form of automatic writing, etc. A second type of premonition might depend upon subconscious inference and deduction, thus being far more accurate and far-seeing than the conscious mind in such matters, particularly when the latter is occupied with everyday practical affairs. Another set of premonitions might be accounted for by assuming that the knowledge given is imparted telepathically or gained clairvoyantly by the subject's own mind. In these cases, the information would be in the minds of other living persons and would be gained from them and given out before the subject had gained the fact normally. Scientific Explanation of Prophecy a fourth type of premonition might be explained by assuming that discarnate spirits play a large part and communicate the information to the recipient of the message in question. In this case, the discarnate intelligence would have to be in possession of certain facts or be enabled to see farther than the psychic himself. And there is much evidence that this is in fact the case on numerous occasions. For example, if we see a spider walking across the table, we know that when it reaches the edge it will either stop or fall over though the spider cannot foresee these facts and continues to walk quite ignorant of the fate in store of it. Again, use a more forceful example. Supposing a friend of yours is walking down the street and is coming to a cross street down which a strong wind is blowing. Being in possession of this knowledge, you can predict with more or less certainty that when your friend reaches this cross street that his hat will blow off, and in fact this actually happens. Now you will see in this case your ability to predict this fact, or partly see into the future, was based on your larger knowledge of certain factors playing about his life. It is only logical to suppose, therefore, that spirits who may be, and probably are in possession of greater psychic powers than we, can foresee tendencies and destinies, to a certain extent, towards which human beings are tending. This being so, they are enabled at times to communicate, perhaps telepathically, statements regarding the future which often turn out to be true. This would be a logical explanation of many cases of premonition of this type, and would explain to us, in a perfectly simple manner, why it is that mistakes and errors so often occur in premonitions of this kind. It would only be what we should expect. It must be admitted, however, that there are many cases of premonitions which cannot be explained in this simple way, and which we cannot in any manner account for, in the present state of science and of our limited knowledge of psychic phenomena. These cases we must simply record and hope that the time may come some day when we will be enabled to comprehend clearly the underlying causal explanation which will make clear to us the real mechanisms by means of which premonitions and prophecies are fulfilled. End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them」this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 33 Reincarnation and Eastern Philosophy. Most religious philosophies of the East are based on the reality of reincarnation, or the embodiment of the same soul in a variety of physical bodies, living on this earth at various stages of the world's history, often separated from each other by a number of years. The doctrine contends that the same individuality is maintained throughout all these lives, as a background, but that each life is also an individual experience which is destined to teach the soul one or more particular lessons, which it needed to learn for the purposes of its ultimate progression and perfection. The doctrine is based largely upon the law of compensation, which says that inasmuch as there is, in this life, so much obvious inequality as regards the material returns, rewards, and happiness, there must be another chance for that soul at another time and under other circumstances and that the poverty and other conditions which may be present in this life are for a purpose and teach a lesson and that quite possibly in some past life the same individual has been extraordinarily wealthy and has misused the riches and power entrusted to him the memory of past lives 
This is a fascinating doctrine, and one which, at first sight, asks us to yield our consent to it. Yet there are many objections to this theory of reincarnation, as we shall see presently. It may be well to answer here one main objection to the doctrine, which is sure to be advanced by the ordinary critic, and this is, that if the same soul be reincarnated a number of times, it should remember its past lives, while as a matter of fact it rarely does so. And if we are to profit or benefit by these in any way, one would think that this memory would be absolutely essential. The theosophist or reincarnationist replies to this, however, by stating that each life is intended to be an individual separate existence, without a memory bond or connection with any previous life. The soul of the individual which reincarnates only reaps the knowledge of each life after death, when this knowledge is added to the total mass of experiences already gained. Thus the individual human life is conceived to be greater than any single life, just as a bucket of water is composed of thousands of drops, each drop being separate until merged with others into the whole. In the same way, each individual life, representing a separate drop, would be individualized until after death, when it is again merged into the total personality. Our inability to remember former lives is accounted for by assuming that there is no direct connection between the total self and the self which is built up in this life through the physical brain. They are separated, though it would take too long to explain here exactly the nature and causes of this separation, according to the doctrines advanced. THE ARGUMENTS FOR REINCARNATION Another argument which is advanced in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation, and to many minds a very strong one, is that life must necessarily be eternal and immortal, inasmuch as it is indestructible by death, and continues to exist to all eternity in the future, and for the same reason it must also have existed from eternity in the past, and it is inconceivable that such a thing as an individual human spirit should continue to exist for ever after the moment of birth, while it did not exist at all previous to that event. These are the main arguments which are brought forward in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation, and we may add to these one argument based upon experimental evidence. It is this, that many of those who have progressed sufficiently in their psychic development can, so they say, remember their past lives, either fractions of them or incidents in them or the whole life may be remembered as a consecutive series of scenes and events many of the leaders of theosophy and other religious systems of this character contend that they can actually do so the majority of spiritualists however are opposed to this view and contend that reincarnation is not a fact though it must be admitted that in the past there has been a great diversity of opinion on this subject the French school of spiritists, formerly headed by Allan Kardec, contends that reincarnation is a fact, and Kardec's work, the Spirits Book, is based entirely upon teachings of spirits, who claim that reincarnation is true. On the other hand, the majority of German, English, and American mediums contend that reincarnation is not true, and spirits who return through them also assert emphatically that it is not a fact. The reason of this apparent contradiction was explained in an earlier chapter. The communicators merely stated their own views and opinions. Reasons for Doubting Reincarnation Now, in considering this doctrine of reincarnation, there are certain factors which we must bear in mind. 1. The average scientific inquirer begins by doubting the reality of survival at all, and contends that nothing persists after the change called death. For him it is annihilation. The first point to be proved, therefore, is that anything at all exists after death, and the phenomena of spiritualism are the only ones which prove this, as before pointed out. Until it is thoroughly established that spirit of any character continues to exist after death, it is useless to argue whether or not such a spirit is reincarnated, for the reason that the average skeptic would contend that there is no such thing as a spirit to reincarnate. 
until this primary fact of spirit existence is proved therefore it is useless to argue concerning this question of reincarnation two assuming that this is granted still there is no proof that reincarnation is a fact if we demand proof in the scientific sense of the world in order to establish such a doctrine as this a tremendous mass of testimony would be necessary far more than the ordinary phenomena of spiritualism which claim to establish a comparatively simple truth yet as a matter of fact there is far less evidence as we all know for the reality of reincarnation than there is for spirit return as the strength of the evidence should be proportioned to the strangeness of the facts it will be seen that we are as yet very far from proving reincarnation according to this standard a vast mass of well-attested evidence would have to be forthcoming and this has not been produced three it is not necessarily true that because the human spirit continues to exist for all eternity in the future it must necessarily have existed from all eternity in the past physics teaches us that a body set in motion comes to rest because of the hindrance or friction from outside forces acting upon it if there be no friction to retard such a body it would theoretically go on forever in a straight line once give a ball an initial push and provided there is no friction it would roll on forever without coming to a stop it might well be therefore that the human spirit once initiated would continue in the same fashion since we can see no hindrances to its progress resembling those acting in our physical world again a speck of mud thrown off from a revolving wheel only exists as an individual speck after it was thrown off in this manner before it was a part of the general mass assuming therefore that an individual human spirit is in some way separated and individualized at birth from the general stock of cosmic life energy at the moment of conception it might be that it continued as an individual thing thereafter for all eternity without necessarily having existed as such in the past the spiral or vortex of life in the next place assuming that life is an individualized force we can quite conceive that this force ascending in a series of spirals tends to become more detached and individualized with each revolution through which it passes and that ultimately it will tend to become detached and thrown off as it were from the vortex of life as an individual being birth might represent this process and again we see that it is not necessary to suppose that human spirit must have existed in the past because it continues to exist in the future as to the law of compensation already mentioned this is not really an argument but rather an emotional belief based upon the idea of justice but in the first place this may not necessarily be true and in the second even supposing that it is the same result is reached in other religions for according to the teachings of orthodox christianity the reward of the poor but righteous is in heaven and according to spiritualistic philosophy it depends on individual progress and effort how we remember past lives the doctrine of reincarnation cannot therefore be said to present a logical justification for the belief there remains the more substantial foundation based upon the before mentioned experimental proof namely that many persons claim that they can remember portions of their past lives and even that they can remember the whole of them these latter cases however are very rare and the material from which one could form one's judgment regarding such cases has never been published owing to the lack of respectable evidence in this direction therefore we may assume for the present and until proof to the contrary be forthcoming that such cases depend not upon reality but upon elaborate subconscious imaginations and romances which these individuals have constructed within themselves as the result of brooding and thinking over possible past lives of their own there are many analogies for this belief and in some cases at least it has been proved beyond all question of doubt 
that these past lives were in reality fictitious and that the memory of them so called was certainly and purely subconscious imagination those who may be interested in obtaining this proof are referred to professor flournoy's book from india to the planet mars where and how these memories originate there remains those cases far less satisfactory and convincing but far more numerous in which isolated incidents of past lives have been remembered or in which scenes have flashed up before the mind together with the impression amounting to a certainty that the individual has experienced or lived through that scene before most cases of this character may be explained in a perfectly natural manner and do not afford any direct proof of the doctrine of reincarnation let me explain a few of the causes which may be operating inducing such apparent memories of past lives in the first place many of them are due to so-called illusions or hallucinations of memory so-called pseudo presentiments in which the event and the feeling that it has transpired become reversed or transposed in the mind so that one remembers the impression as occurring before the real event while in reality it happened afterward that this occurs in many cases has been scientifically proved in the second place dreams or subconsciously noted impressions which never come into consciousness may suddenly flash up in connection with a certain mental event and this would give rise to a feeling true in a sense that we had experienced it before we had but in a dream and not in a previous life thirdly many experiences conversations etc overseen or overheard before the age of four when the personality is in the process of formation and when consecutive memory and consciousness of self is said to begin may be remembered as isolated experiences and these may also give rise to the impression that we had seen them or experienced them before again this is a fact but it was not in a previous life lastly there are many cases in which the subconscious mind noted a scene or event a fraction of second or perhaps several seconds or even minutes before the conscious mind did and when the latter became aware of it there would again be this sense of familiarity and the feeling that we had seen or experienced this event before this is true but it was only a short time before the actual experience for all these reasons therefore and others which it would take too long to give the majority of spiritualists and psychical researchers do not at present regard the doctrine of reincarnation as true or in any way adequately proved and prefer to believe until this proof be forthcoming that the individual human spirit is initiated at birth builds up its own life by its own efforts and experiences and that it continues to improve upon this life by continuous striving after it has reached the spiritual world in the same manner that it does here on earth end of chapter thirty three reincarnation and eastern philosophy recording by pamela krantz Chapter 34 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herward Carrington. Chapter 34 The Ethics of Spiritualism As explained at the beginning of this book of instruction, spiritualism is not only a scientific question, but it is also a philosophical and a religious question. It is approachable from the point of view of phenomena, also that of theology and ethics. The student who has followed the work thus far has doubtless progressed to some extent in the understanding, if not in the control of psychic phenomena, and fields of knowledge have been opened up before him. 
of which he had previously been more or less unaware. But all this would not only be unavailing, but harmful if spiritualism were not ethically and spiritually right, as well as phenomenally true. It is no good developing something which leads one ultimately only into a mire of harmful results and a false philosophy. If spiritualism cannot be justified from the religious and ethical standpoint, it should be let entirely alone by all save the few scrupulously scientific investigators who approach the subject from that point of view and not as a belief. It is very important, therefore, for the spiritualist to have his belief founded in correct ethical principles. For, as I have before pointed out, the reproach has been raised against spiritualists that they are everything but spiritual. Unfortunately, there are many of this type, but they are doubtless in the minority. And the majority of spiritualists wish to see their faiths grounded on firm ethical principles. Is it right to investigate psychic phenomena? Various questions arise in this connection. The objection to spiritualism may first of all be raised that such things are God's secrets, which he keeps to himself. What is the use of seeking? You will find nothing. But to this, Monsignor Camille Flammarion replies rightly, there always have been people who liked ignorance better than knowledge. By this kind of reasoning, had man acted upon it, nothing would ever have been known of this world. It is the mode of reasoning adopted by those who do not care to think for themselves and who confide to directors, so-called, the charge of controlling their consciences. If these phenomena really exist, they must be part of the universe and subject to natural law, for otherwise they could not exist at all. There is no such thing as the supernatural. All is natural, even if it be the communication of spirits. It may be unusual or uncommon, and because of this we call these phenomena supernormal that is beyond the ordinary normal experience of mankind, but they are not and cannot be supernatural. Concerning fraud and error. Again, the objection may be raised that these phenomena foster superstition, that this is based upon the belief that the phenomena are necessarily untrue. Once the reality of the facts is established, there is no superstition connected with it. It becomes merely a question of scientific evidence. Again, the objection has been raised against spiritualism on the ground that it encourages fraud and charlatanism. To some extent, this is true, but other cults have suffered in the same way and all sincere spiritualists are the first to expose falsity and fraud when they meet it. There are spiritualists, it is true, who endeavor to shelter fraudulent mediums and pretend that this fraud does not exist. Such a method is a great mistake and only tends to degrade and lower spiritualism as a religious belief in the eyes of the public. Truth is mighty and shall prevail, and truth should above all else be the watchword of the true spiritualist. Is it healthy and normal? Then there is the objection that spiritualistic practices encourage morbid and abnormal states and conditions and help to induce insanity. Again, there is some excuse for this argument 
But as so often pointed out, it is the conscious or unconscious abuse of psychic and mediumistic power rather than its use, which is so dangerous and detrimental. In the initial experimental stages of spiritualism, some harm has doubtless resulted to some experimenters, but this is only a stronger reason for urging us to discover and rightly understand the laws and conditions under which psychic phenomena and spirit communication may operate. When these are once understood, they are thereby rendered safe, and thenceforward there is no reason why spiritualistic practices should be unsafe, save for those who neglect its well-ascertained laws. Again, it has been urged that it is wrong to communicate with spirits of the departed for the reason that such communication is not natural and that by doing so we interfere with the progression and spiritual development of those who have passed over. But the reply to this is twofold. In the first place, the many cases of spirit return which are recorded prove that these phenomena are far more common than is usually supposed, and for this reason it is not so exceptional a thing, but almost a common occurrence. It partakes more of the nature of natural law than of the experimental or miraculous event. If such is the case, it can hardly be detrimental or unnatural, since none of nature's laws are unnatural. Does spirit communication retard progression? Again, there is no reason to suppose that communication retards the spiritual progress of those who have died. On the contrary, we might suppose that in many cases, at least, such communication would certainly help the spirits. And in many cases, as we know, they have repeatedly come back for the express purpose of asking the living to carry out some mission for them which weighed upon their minds. And they have stated that they could get no rest or comfort until this mission has been fulfilled. There are many cases, again, as we know, wherein the returning spirits have requested help and the prayers of the living to assist them in their progress, and many spiritualists have devoted their lives to this work, namely assisting earthbound spirits and helping them in their natural spiritual progress. Many spirits have returned to impart certain information or to give counsel, warning, or advice to friends and relatives of theirs still living. And we cannot but believe that they are far happier in doing so than if they were obliged to stand by and see some unhappiness, accident, or catastrophe overtake their loved ones on earth, while they themselves were obliged to remain inactive. Were they still alive, they would like to feel that they had prevented such a catastrophe, and it is only natural to suppose that they continue to live in this way and continue to take an interest in their loved ones after they have passed over. In this way, spiritual communication becomes a natural and beautiful belief. Should the dead know our sorrows? This brings us to another important question from the ethical point of view. And this is that the so-called dead are in constant sympathetic communication with those still living, and that they, after they have died, have a knowledge of our lives, our trials, and our tribulations. Many religious persons contend that this is a very unethical belief, and that they should know nothing of those on this earth after once they have died. Yet, this is surely contrary to all human sympathy and experience. 
a mother wrapped up in the interests of her child would surely prefer to remain near it and watch over, guard and guide it, if possible, for a few years, rather than to desert it wholly and be totally ignorant of its life and progress. Yet, this is what Orthodox religion contends they should do. Spiritualism is far more ethical in this respect than the ordinary religious teachings, since it tells us that constant sympathetic rapport exists between this world and the next, and that there is no abrupt severing of the ties of human sympathy and love at the moment of death. This surely is a comforting thought for the bereaved. The Ethical Teachings of Spiritualism The religious teachings of spiritualism are otherwise far more ethical than those of any other religion. Instead of a world devoted to selfish personal progression, subject to the changeable whims of an external deity, we have in the teachings of spiritualism a perfectly consistent and scientifically founded religious faith, quite in accordance with the doctrine of evolution. All progress depends upon personal development. As Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace says in his Miracles of Modern Spiritualism, the hypothesis of spiritualism not only accounts for all the facts and is the only one that does so, but it is further remarkable as being associated with a theory of a future state of existence, which is the only one yet given to the world that can at all commend itself to the modern philosophical mind. The main doctrines of this religion are that after death, man's spirit survives in an ethereal body, gifted with new powers, but mentally and morally the same individual as when clothed in flesh. That he commences from that moment a course of apparently endless progression, which is rapid just in proportion as his mental and moral faculties were active while on earth. That his comparative happiness or misery will depend entirely on himself and that just in proportion as his higher human faculties have taken part in all his pleasures here, will he find himself contented and happy in a state of existence in which they will have the same exercise, while he who has depended more on the body than on the mind for his pleasures will, when that body is no more, feel a grievous want and must slowly and painfully develop his intellectual and moral nature till its exercise shall become easy and pleasurable. Neither punishments nor rewards are meted out by an external power, but each one's condition is the natural and inevitable sequence of his condition here. He starts again from the level of moral and intellectual development to which he has raised himself while on earth. Should mediums accept money? One other point remains to be considered. It is this, that mediums accept money for their services, and inasmuch as this is a spiritual gift, it is wrong. Yet, this is common to all other religions. Do not ministers of all other religions receive compensation in some form or other for their services? As long as mediums are living in this material world, they are obliged to meet the costs of living like all other human beings, no matter how spiritual their work or they themselves may be. If mediums possess genuine power, it is only natural, in a sense, that they should utilize it and turn it to account, and it is certainly true that by doing so, they help their fellow men and help those who come to them as much or more 
than men in any other walk in life. This being so, it can hardly be said that any aspect of spiritualism is in itself unethical. It is, on the contrary, the most sensible, rational, and ethical religion in the world. End of chapter 34. Recorded by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, CynthiaSheeler.iCanVoice.com. Chapter 35 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Chapter 35 What Happens After Death. Precisely what happens at the moment of death is one of the most dramatically interesting and one of the most striking, insoluble problems in the world today. It remains for us the problem of all problems, the mystery of the universe, the science of being. One moment we see a figure before us, a muscular, powerful man, capable of heroic efforts, great intellectual flights, lofty aspirations, delivering an oration which stirs the hearts of thousands, and perhaps helps to sway the destiny of nations, and change the map of the world. The next moment he is lying on the floor, a corpse, lifeless, inanimate, incapable of the slightest thought, the slightest muscular exertion. He is the victim of heart failure. The Mystery of Death a second and all has changed. Nothing can now be influenced by him. Nothing is now possible but the gradual decomposition of the body and its return to the dust from whence it sprang. Could any change be more profound or more lasting, since it can occur, presumably but once in all eternity? The slightest anatomical variation in the man's body, so small, perhaps, that even a microscope cannot detect it, and we then behold the most mighty change which occurs in nature, the profoundest of tragedies and wonders. We behold the transition from the living to the lifeless. We pass from life to death. What is this change we have seen before us? Can we in any way understand it? What can we learn? What see? These are questions over which men have pondered for centuries and which still form the most fascinating problem in the realm of spiritual inquiry. Why we should not fear death Many persons fear death, but they should not do so, for the reason that, on any theory, it is not a thing to be feared. It has been proved abundantly that, with the exception of very rare cases, there is no pain at the moment of death, and no consciousness of dying. Both are obliterated by the kind hand of nature. The suffering which goes before belongs rather to life than to death. And in fact, many of those who have suffered from some torturing disease have died with a smile of happiness and contentment on their faces. Of the physical body we need think little, since the spiritual body separates itself from this body after death, and thenceforward is as unconscious of it as we are of a finger, or any part of our body which has been cut off during life. The human spirit takes some time to become severed completely from the physical body, and for this reason it should not be buried or cremated too soon after death. But with these exceptions we need think little of the state of the physical body, since we sever our connections with it entirely as soon as we pass into the spirit world. What happens after we have effected this separation is naturally a question of absorbing interest to many minds, since all of us have to look forward to this experience. The statements of clairvoyance and of those spirits who have returned to tell us of their passage into the next life should therefore be of considerable interest in this connection. Let us see what they have to say. A Clairvoyant Description of Death Andrew Jackson Davis, one of the founders of modern spiritualism and a gifted seer, 
describes the process as follows. Suppose the person is now dying. It is to be a rapid death. The feet first grow cold. The clairvoyant sees right over the head what may be called a magnetic halo, an etheric emanation, in appearance golden and throbbing as though conscious. The body is now cold up to the knees and elbows, and the emanation has ascended higher in the air. The legs are cold to the hips and the arms to the shoulders, and the emanation, though it has not risen higher in the room, is more expanded. The death coldness steals over the breast and around on one side, and the emanation has attained a higher position nearer the ceiling. The person has ceased to breathe, the pulse is feeble, and the emanation is elongated and fashioned in the outline of the human form. Beneath it is connected with the brain. The head of the person is internally throbbing, a slow, deep throb, not painful, but like the beat of the sea. Hence the thinking faculties are rational, while nearly every part of the person is dead. Owing to the brain's momentum, I have seen a dying person, even at the last feeble pulse beat, rise impulsively in bed to converse with a friend. But the next instant he was gone, his brain being the last to yield up the life principle. FORMATION OF THE SPIRITUAL BODY the golden emanation which extends up midway to the ceiling is connected with the brain by a very fine life thread now the body of the emanation ascends then appears something white and shining like a human head next in a very few moments a faint outline of the face divine then the fair neck and shoulders then in rapid succession come all parts of the new body down to the feet a bright shining image a little smaller than its physical body, but a perfect prototype or reproduction in all, except its disfigurements. The fine life thread continues attached to the old brain. The next thing is the withdrawal of the electric principle. When this thread snaps, the spiritual body is free and prepared to accompany its guardians to the summer land. Yes, there is a spiritual body. It is sown in dishonor and raised in brightness. How it feels to pass over. Here again, what a returning spirit says, who has passed through the valley of the shadow of death, and has apparently returned to tell us his experiences. When I awoke in the spirit life and perceived that I had hands and feet and all that belongs to the human body, I cannot express to you in the form of words the feelings which at that moment seemed to take possession of my soul. I realized that I had this body, a spiritual body. Imagine, if you can, what the surprise of a spirit must be, to find, after the struggle of death, that he is a newborn spirit, free from the decaying tabernacle of flesh that he leaves behind him. I gazed on weeping friends with a saddened heart, mingled with joy, knowing as I did that I could be with them and behold them daily, though unseen and unknown. And as I gazed upon the lifeless tenement of clay, and could behold the beauty of its mechanism, I felt impelled to seek the author of so much beauty and youth and prostrate myself at his feet. I felt a light touch on my shoulder, and joy unspeakable. I beheld the loved ones of earth, some of whom had long since departed from the earth plane, and I felt myself ascending, or rather floating onward and upward, through the radiance of space. I saw about me many spirits, and their guides, bearing them company through the bright realms of immensity. Novel Experiences on the Other Side So the human spirit issuing from the body gradually rises higher and higher, and comes into touch and harmony with those about it, and with those who possess sympathy and mutual interest. As explained in the chapter devoted to the spirit world, it is highly improbable that there are any physical barriers between the spheres one from another, but they are doubtless separated nevertheless by walls of mental and spiritual origin. If we are in one of these planes, we must progress upward, before we can reach or remain with those whom we desire most. And for this reason there is a hell, so to say, 
for those who cannot attain what they desire, which can only be by continual striving upward and onward. In this, however, they are constantly helped and assisted by spirit guides and helpers, so that progress is rapid when it is really desired and worked for. HOW WE TURN BACK TO COMMUNICATE On the lower planes of existence, communication with those of the earth is, it is said, comparatively easy. But this becomes increasingly difficult as we ascend in the upward scale. It has often been pointed out that descending to communicate with those on earth is something like going down to the bottom of a muddy pool. And those who desire to go to the bottom of muddy pools are very rare, even on this earth. Still, spirits moved by ties of love for those left behind make the attempt from time to time, successful or unsuccessful in proportion to favorable or unfavorable conditions. This, however, we discussed in former chapters. As we progress, we are said to acquire more interest in the new world and lose interest in this just as we gradually lose interest in one country when we move into another. New scenes, new interests, and the new environment gradually alter our line of thought. But just as we are always glad to see a relative or an old friend from the hometown or the motherland, so are we most happy to meet and greet those who pass over when their turn comes to join us in the spirit world. HOW WE PROGRESS IN THE SPIRIT WORLD After these initial stages have passed, upward progress and development begin. For many, however, the shock of death has a very severe effect, especially in cases of suicide, and those who have met with sudden and violent deaths. In such cases these spirits require some time to recover their normal selves, and have to be nursed back to health, as it were, on the other side. The same is true of those spirits who have had their minds affected by some mental or physical disease. But after this stage has been passed, they all emerge into the brightness beyond, and begin their interest, their instruction, their learning, and their progress of soul and spirit, as well as of intellect, which is to occupy them for ages of time to come. Those who die are received and cared for by loving friends on the other side, just as they were when they were born into this world. One need have no hesitation nor fear on this account. Physical birth is a terrible experience, but we remember nothing of it, and there are always those present who will tender and care for us. In the same way, birth into the spirit world through the gates of death is in many ways a terrible shock. Yet we are cared for by loving guardians and received with love and care, finding happiness awaiting us when we pass from this world into the world beyond. End of chapter 35 what happens after death? Recording by Pamela Krantz. Chapter 36 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 36 Bad and Perverted Uses of Spiritualism Every gift or power can be abused. Many in the past have turned their increased psychic powers into evil channels. At various times in the world's history, and who continue to do so today. They are known as magicians, witches, vampires, possessors of the evil eye, etc., etc. For the moment, it may be pointed out that psychic unfoldment and increase of psychic power brings with it added responsibility. As our power in this direction is increased, so also we are expected to use it rightly. If much has been given us, much is expected. It is quite possible, it is true, for these powers to be turned to bad account, and others injured, wealth acquired, etc., 
temporarily by their use. But if these powers are used for these purposes, they are usually soon lost, and then the student is in a far worse condition than before, for the reason that he is not only without the added power which he craves, but also has deteriorated mentally, morally, and physically as the result of their harmful use. THE DIFFERENCE BETWEEN MAGIC AND MEDIUMSHIP In the Middle Ages, psychic powers were undoubtedly used for good and bad purposes. White magic was beneficial, and black magic harmful. White magic invoked angels. Black magic invoked devils. In neither case were the spirits of departed human beings called upon, but rather intelligences, either lower or higher than man in the human scale of evolution. Another thing which distinguishes mediumship from magic is that mediumship is more in the nature of a request, a calling upon human intelligences for help and advice. Magic, on the other hand, depends upon invocation or demanding the presence and assistance of other intelligences differing from the human, and their assistance in the work to be performed. How Invocations Are Performed For the purposes of this invocation, various magical practices were undertaken, such as prayer, the saying of certain words and sentences, preparation of the magic circle with its pentagram, seal of Solomon, etc., as well as utilizing various magical preparations secured from dead bodies and the poisons of animals and reptiles, etc. These magical practices were usually undertaken at certain seasons and phases of the moon, after long training on the part of the magician, and in specially prepared rooms or localities, which had been kept apart only for magical purposes, exact descriptions of such invocations and the methods employed are to be found in certain rare books on the ritual of magic. But inasmuch as they are neither healthy nor desirable, we do not deem it wise or right to place these teachings before the student, who might be tempted, did he possess the knowledge, to put them into operation, and thus injure himself mentally and morally, perhaps beyond repair. Students who are interested may consult A. E. Waite, The Book of Black Magic and of Pax, Levi, The Doctrine and Ritual of Transcendental Magic, etc. An Explanation of Witchcraft During the Middle Ages also, witchcraft flourished. It depended upon the use of certain psychic powers which witches were said to possess. Only in their cases this power came directly from the devil himself being bestowed upon them in person by his satanic majesty. The witches were all said to meet two or three times a year on some lonely mountaintop at midnight, these meetings being called Sabbaths. At these Sabbaths, all sorts of magical and anti-religious ceremonies were held. The sacrament was mocked. The devil was worshipped, etc. The witch was said to swear allegiance to the devil, who thereupon touched her on some part of the body which became anaesthetic, lacking all sensation. These marks occurred in various parts of the body, and such marks were consequently known as witch marks. The probable explanation of such cases is that in connection with the abnormal mental and physical states induced by witches, 
there resulted in a peculiar form of hysteria in which small zones or patches on the body became anaesthetic modern science now recognizes the existence of such insensible patches and calls them anaesthetic zones they are typical of this form of hysteria this is the modern scientific explanation of the so-called witch marks the journeys to the sabbaths were doubtless for the most part imaginary flights resulting from the administration of opiates and other drugs which they were known to take and with which they anointed their bodies at the same time it is probable that there were many genuine supernormal psychical phenomena connected with witchcraft and this is becoming more and more probable as we progress in the understanding of such cases devil worship another form of perverted occultism is that of devil worship which exists in various forms even today in paris the malay peninsula in london in new york and doubtless in other large cities at these meetings which are devoted to devil worship various invocations etc are gone through and the devil is said to appear in person and bestow power upon certain privileged members of the club who are thereafter enabled to use certain powers to their own advantage many of the scenes of these devil worshipping societies are too revolting to be described but have been pictured at length on one or two occasions by those who have taken part in these invocations the evil eye again certain individuals have a power which is known as the evil eye this is particularly believed in by the peasants of naples and southern italy by the peasantry of southern spain austria and other countries anyone possessing the evil eye is supposed to have the power of bewitching or maiming any person or animal upon whom he throws his glance cattle looked at by one possessing the evil eye invariably become sick and die crops fail pestilence falls etc the evil eye is a gift which is usually unsought but comes spontaneously and is not desired by anyone the sure way to guard against the evil eye according to the beliefs of the countries mentioned is to extend the first and fourth fingers of the hand toward the possessors of the evil eye the second and third fingers being folded over into the palm of the hand and kept there by the thumb in this position the outer fingers somewhat resemble the horns of a bull and if the hand holding the fingers in this position be pointed at any of the children or beggars in the above-named countries they will usually turn and fly from the sign-maker many europeans use this knowledge to rid themselves of uh, pestilent beggars vampires and how they attack another form of evil influence which is said to exist and is particularly believed in by the natives of silesia moravia and southern carpathia is that covered by the general word vampire in our ordinary language a vampire is a species of bat and the word is employed because human vampires were said to assume the shape of large bats at times flying in the windows when their victims are asleep a vampire is one who sucks the life-blood of his victims through two small holes punctured in the skin in very much the same way that a mosquito sucks our blood after puncturing the epidermis 
these holes are said to occur usually in the throat and the victim is of course attacked as a rule during sleep those who are vampires after they are dead and buried are enabled in some miraculous way it is said to leave their coffins and tombs and wander about seeking victims when they are dug up they are found fresh with a pink complexion and the whole body engorged with blood the only sure way to kill vampires it is said is to drive a stake through the heart or cut off the head when a quantity of fresh blood will gush forth and the vampire is killed forever tradition also says that those who are bitten by vampires become vampires in turn modern vampirage vampires of a certain sort however are not unknown in our own day in an interesting article on vampires in the occult review june 1908 dr franz hartmann described a method of what might be termed natural vampirage he refers to the bible first kings one and also alludes to certain processes by which one person is enabled to draw vital energy from another by establishing close contact this process of nature is governed by well-fixed laws through ignorance of these laws many people have become victims of modern vampirage another form of perverted occultism which remains is the employment of charms amulets talismans etc which are often sold for the purpose of inducing mental and physical disease and black magic which has existed through all ages we must not forget also the so-called voodoo practices of the natives of west africa which are said to be remarkable by those who have witnessed them how to protect yourself from occult and evil influences it is often a little difficult for the modern student of the occult to determine just how much he is to believe in these stories undoubtedly most of them are based on superstition fanaticism and imagination at the same time there is enough truth in them to make us be cautious and put us on our guard never under any circumstances should you undertake to practice any of them for low selfish purposes in order to protect yourself from influences of this sort if you feel that they are being wielded against you resort to the measures outlined in previous chapters and you may be sure that if you do this you will be impervious to all ordinary influences of this kind end of chapter 36chapter 37 of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by alex caraz your psychic powers and how to develop them by hereward carrington chapter 37 snares and pitfalls to avoid the cautious student of psychics who desires to progress along the right lines scientifically and mathematically must be on his guard against all possible sources of delusion and error which may creep into his development so he may never mistake the false for the true or spurious phenomena for the genuine a few sources of error and some of the mistakes which the psychic student is apt to make will be pointed out in this chapter together with the means and methods of guarding against them first of all do not be too credulous of the phenomena you receive and accept if you have a chill or a nervous twitch do not assume that this is some message or a touch from a spirit hand it may be so but you must receive good proof of the fact before accepting it 
Should you be too credulous and accept all such incidents as genuine phenomena, you will soon be led away so far that you will become unbalanced in your point of view. The over-negative condition. In your development, do not be too negative. Hold the mind always centered and conscious, as I have said, and keep the center of yourself always active. It is only safe to abandon this in very advanced studies. Do not be too negative in your daily life or accept the advice which spirits or mediums give you to the exclusion of all else. You should reason in such matters thus. An intelligence has offered me certain advice. If that person were yet alive and offered me the same advice, would I take it? You should accept the advice of spirits as you would that of human beings who are merely spirits still in the flesh. In other words, as so often pointed out before in previous chapters, use your own judgment and discrimination on all messages received. If the messages are of an erratic nature, such as those which ask you to give up your position, go on a long journey, etc., you should be most cautious and only accept such advice after you have fully proved to your own satisfaction that it is wise and beneficial. Abuse of the Sixth Sense Do not depend upon your sixth sense until you have exhausted the senses you already possess. If you refuse to let these work, you can hardly suppose that help and assistance will come from outside. No, seed will not grow in a soil that is not prepared. Neither will spiritual help be planted in your mental soil if you have not worked to prepare it for the spiritual influx. As a rule, our own individual spirit is the best guide. We must consult this first. After that, if you seek additional advice and help, this may often be obtained from wise and experienced psychics, but I cannot too strongly warn the student against accepting the advice of poorly developed mediums, either professional or amateur. On Changing Mediums and Circles it is not a good thing to change developing mediums if this can be avoided. If you have found one medium who can assist you to develop and who is apparently doing so helpfully and rightly, stick to him through thick and thin until his advice or help fails you. The mixture of magnetism which is introduced with change of developing mediums may be at times very harmful. The same thing may be said of circles. Once a circle of sitters is formed, the same group should sit night after night and it is not at all a good practice to allow strangers constantly to intrude into the circle and take the places of others. If changes must be made, let one at a time assume the place of the absent sitter and let him sit thoroughly familiar with the surroundings and conditions before a second change is made. You would be wise to mistrust names of important historical persons if they appear in your own speech or writing or if they are obtained at seances. Our natural vanity may lead us to hope and expect that such personages may be present, but there is evidence that in many cases lying spirits have taken the place of those whose names they gave. In this connection, it may be said that the historical personages are not, as a rule, most desirable. The best help and the greatest teachings have been obtained from simple people who are now on the other side. Sensitivity and Mediumship Do not try from the first to develop as a medium. Try rather to cultivate your own psychic powers and strengthen your own inner nature. After you have developed psychically and spiritually in this way, you will be far better enabled to receive and transmit genuine mediumistic messages. Better enabled also to interpret them. Better able to withstand the strain of mediumship and run far less danger of obsession and other unpleasant symptoms which badly developed mediums are likely to encounter. Cultivate your psychic self. Therefore, and after this has been truly trained, begin to train your mediumistic powers. Be on the lookout for evil and lying spirits, who will constantly deceive you if you are not prepared for them, and remain too open and receptive. Study your own phenomena and endeavor to disengage genuine psychic and mediumistic manifestations from those due to your own subconscious mind. This is an excellent and very helpful practice, which will prove useful to you as you progress. Do not assume that all figures which you see are spirits. They may be thought forms, doubles, etheric bodies, or imaginary creations of your own. Things a psychic should avoid. You can only learn to disentangle this wonderful chain and separate the true from the false after months and perhaps years of study, observation, and experiment. Above all, remember that symbolic figures and representations must be interpreted symbolically and should never be accepted as representing the truth as it actually exists. 
One of the great dangers to the amateur medium, as before explained, is that of extending his symbolic, intuitive impressions beyond the proper point. If he stated only what was given him, he would usually be right, but if he endeavors to interpret them himself, find their explanations, etc., he very often goes wrong. Do not hang on too long, so to say, to the impressions and images you perceive. Let them float before you in space, seeing and analyzing them as they pass. Do not endeavor to hold them to you by the power of your mind. If you do so, they will not only vanish and disappear, but you will be unable to retain the impression you receive, and quite possibly the power of perceiving these images which you now possess will become less and less and gradually leave you. Always remember that psychic phenomena of this character cannot be commanded. They can only be sought and welcomed when they appear. In other words, they are spontaneous and not experimental phenomena. How to distinguish the true from the false. If you constantly make use of your own judgment and critical faculty in studying the phenomena which you develop or those which you may observe in others, you will build up within yourself two things. One of these is the power of judging, that is the ability to perceive the true from the false, and which above all else is what you as a psychic desire. It is difficult to explain the difference in words, but as nearly as possible it may be said that these phenomena which are innately true carry with them a sense of conviction, a feeling of warmth and familiarity, and we feel them as part of ourselves. The other phenomena, although occurring in our own minds, will seem to us cold, strange, and extraneous, and when once this power to distinguish between the two types of phenomena has been developed, you have taken one of the most important forward steps that is possible for any psychic to take. Many mediums, indeed, never reach this state. Their mediumship is chaotic. It has never been developed on rational, progressive lines. But if you have done so, you may rest assured that you are not only a genuine and true medium, but you have passed through the early stages and danger zones which so often beset the student in the early stages of development. How to Guard Against Outside Influence the second important step which the student takes after he has once passed this stage is that while he will be sensitive and receptive to telepathic clairvoyant and other forms of perception, and also to spirits both in and out of the body, he will be practically impervious to harmful or malicious thoughts and influences which may be impelled against him not only on this sphere, but by the spirit world as well. If a trance clairvoyant during a state of ecstasy leaves his body and wanders off into space, without having previously gained sufficient knowledge and hence control of the situation, he is liable to be blown hither and thither, figuratively speaking, like a soap bubble by the breezes, and will be open to impressions from all sources. These he may not feel or know at the time, but he may carry these back with him into his body, and afterwards they may affect him to the detriment of his own mental and spiritual health. In other words, he has not learned to protect himself while severed from the body as he can while in it. This is one of the greatest dangers which the advanced psychic is liable to encounter, and at the same time, after he has once learned the secret of protecting himself in this manner, he may be assured that thenceforward his progress will be most marked and rapid, not only in psychic and mediumistic development, but in the spirit world after he has entered it permanently at death. The Value of Psychic Development to the Individual Psychic development is, therefore, of inestimable worth, if rightly cultivated for the rapid progression of the individual human spirit, just as much as the same power badly employed is harmful to the human spirit, both here and hereafter. It all depends on the manner in which these forces and powers have been cultivated and are utilized. And while too much cannot be said against their improper use, a great deal may be said in favor of their proper application and development in the right direction. It is my hope that every reader of this book will develop himself along the right lines, and that he may receive help, advice, and encouragement at all stages of his spiritual unfoldment, both here and hereafter. End of chapter 37 Recording by Alex Caraz, New York Chapter 38 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Ward Carrington. Chapter 38. 
Physical Phenomena The physical phenomena of spiritualism, as distinct from the mental or psychical phenomena, are those which relate to the physical world and in which some mechanical or physical movement of matter takes place. In clairvoyance, for example, no such physical phenomena occur, so far as we can see. But if a table be lifted into the air by supernormal means, we here come into contact with mechanical and physical forces, and with these we have to reckon. Phenomena with Physical Contact We must begin at the beginning in treating of physical phenomena and go back, first of all, to those which involve some form of contact. Doubtless you have seen performances of so-called mind readers who found lost articles which were hidden in various parts of the room or hall, when one who knew their hiding place held the psychic's hand or placed it to his forehead, etc. In most of these performances it is not mind reading at all, strictly speaking, which we see, but what is technically known as muscle reading, that is, the faint unconscious twitchings of the muscles of the person holding the psychic's hand are felt and interpreted by him, consciously or unconsciously, and these guide him to the spot where the article is hidden. Incredible as it may appear, this is the correct explanation of these cases, and you may easily test it for yourself by asking a group of your friends to hide some object while you are out of the room, and then, when you enter, to give you one of their hands. If now you concentrate on the faint pullings and pushings which they will give you, you will be enabled to find the article in nine cases out of ten. Of course, this, like everything else, improves with practice, and you must not expect to be an expert on the first trial. Some performers who have had years of experience grow so proficient in this, however, that they are enabled to open safes whose combinations they do not know, while merely holding the hand of one who does or even drive a cab along the streets of a crowded city while blindfolded and holding the hand of one who can see the vehicles on the street. The Development of Independent Force and Power The next step is in planchette writing, where the hand, as before explained, moves at first as the result of unconscious muscular action. After a time, however, some psychic force seems to be developed and the board often continues to move about even after the hands of the operator are removed from it. Beyond this again, we have those cases of so-called dousing, where the forked hazel twig bends to and fro in the hands of the water finder when he walks over water and metals. The simple movements which are felt at first are probably due to muscular twitchings, but as the force develops, it seems to become more independent and the twig is bent in spite of the efforts to hold it. Table Tipping and Levitations the next class of physical phenomena are those with the table. A group sits around an ordinary table and can tilt and tip it, as many have doubtless seen. The first simple movements here, as formerly, are probably due to the unconscious muscular pressure of those having their hands on the table. But later on, as the psychic force develops and charges the table, it seems to assume an independent character, and the table often continues to move when all hands are withdrawn from it. In fact, as an expert psychic student has pointed out, in many instances, and especially under unfavorable conditions, the phenomena do not rise above the initial stage of simple, non-intelligent movements, leaving the impression on the minds of the investigators that the force exhibited is, if at present unknown and unaccounted for, nevertheless a natural and mechanical one, and that the action of independent intelligence in connection with it cannot be conceived. This has been the experience and has been the verdict of even scientific inquirers who have not hesitated to give that verdict to the world. How the power increases. Such a conclusion is based upon inaccurate knowledge and upon imperfect and superficial observation. All experienced psychic students are aware that it is often only after repeated and prolonged sittings that the full development of the psychic force is obtained and that independent intelligence is exhibited in connection with it, and that in by far the larger number of instances that stage of the experiment is never reached at all. That it is, however, the ultimate issue of the experiment is now admitted by all patient and painstaking students, who have devoted sufficient time to the observation of the phenomena and who have carried on their investigations with an open mind and in a systematic manner. As will be seen later on, 
it is fully admitted that the mysterious force thus called into operation in some unknown way issues from the physical organism of the sensitive and the sitters and is in itself an unintelligent force but it is with equal confidence asserted that when it is available in sufficient quantity and is wholly detached from the physical organism it can be and beyond all doubt is frequently manipulated by intelligences independent of and other than that of the psychic and the investigators assisting in the experiment how physical phenomena are produced the principle upon which many physical phenomena are based then is simply this there is a vital or a nervous force existing in many of us as described in an earlier chapter which is usually limited to the surface of our own bodies so that unless we touch the object in question we cannot move it under certain conditions however this vital energy or fluid is capable of being projected outward beyond the normal bodily limits into space and when powerful enough is capable of moving physical objects with which it comes into contact or if it be a rapid outward projection of this force it produces percussive sounds or raps well known to spiritualists this psychic force is often uncontrolled and then objects are moved without the knowledge of and even against the wish of the medium we then have the so-called spontaneous poltergeist phenomena etc at other times this force may be guided and manipulated by the conscious or unconscious mind of the medium beyond this stage again is one in which the medium is unconscious of what is occurring having passed into trance etc and it is then that many of the most striking physical phenomena occur at such times complicated and intelligent physical manifestations are produced which are not due either to the mind of the medium or to any person present externalized vital energy we here enter the realm of genuine physical phenomena produced by spirit intelligences most of the communications are obtained through raps following a code playing upon musical instruments etc are due to this source in other words after a certain point has been reached the externalized vital energy or psychic power of the medium is manipulated by an external intelligence and they can even create forms or phantoms by utilizing it as will be explained in the chapter devoted to materialization controlling the phenomena very interesting experiments have been conducted in the past in controlling these physical phenomena but not much success has been attained in this direction there is here a wide field for experiment which the thoughtful student might enter thus on one occasion a medium who has had the power of producing raps was hypnotized and it was suggested that raps should be produced at will according to the suggestion of the hypnotist this was completely successful it was also suggested that raps be obtained in any article of furniture which the hypnotist would suggest this also succeeded the range and variety of physical phenomena are very great including manifestations such as raps table levitations movement of objects without contact playing upon musical instruments without apparent cause spirit and thought photography materialization slate writing trumpet phenomena etc the effect of light all physical phenomena seem to be hindered very largely by light either daylight or artificial light and they can very rarely be produced except in darkness should you attempt to obtain phenomena of this character therefore it would be well for you to sit in the darkness especially at first and then request that more and more light be permitted as your power increases and the phenomena appear most mediums begin their development by seating themselves in a cabinet in a darkened room and often it is necessary to sit in this way for every evening for several weeks or even months before any phenomena appear if you are naturally psychic however and physical phenomena are going to be manifested through your mediumship you would doubtless only have to sit for a fraction of this time in order for the first manifestations to make themselves felt and probably afterwards you would be so interested in the process that you would not count the time you spent in your development first symptoms and phenomena it is probable that the first indications of phenomena of this character you will receive are tiny spots of light which form before you in space and either suddenly appear or remain stationary for some time and then join themselves together forming one larger light as time progresses you will see that this light cloudy mass will become more and more definite in outline and shape 
and will probably begin to assume the shape of a phantom or form standing before you. When this stage has been reached, you should concentrate your receptive faculties and endeavor to get on rapport with this form, for such it now is, and after a time you will be doubtless be able to establish more or less intelligent mental communication and exchange messages. This will usually appear before physical phenomena become manifest, though in certain cases it may be later on. Dr. Baraduk of Paris succeeded on several occasions in photographing those groups of light or masses of matter which thus floated before him, and the student who has once succeeded in receiving manifestations of a like nature might well conduct similar experiments if he be sufficiently alert and able to do so. If not, a friend who is with him and has attended his process of development might endeavor to take these photographs at the moment when the psychic states they are vividly present before him. There are thus two ways of cultivating physical mediumship. One is to sit in the dark, the other is to experiment more or less consciously in light or semi-darkness, and when a certain amount of power has been gained in this direction, to endeavor to transfer or carry this over into the dark seance and to transmit this power to a spirit who will thenceforth utilize it and by its aid produce physical phenomena. Developing in the Dark if you sit for physical development in the dark, you are never sure what kind of phenomena you are to obtain. In a seance, this is beneficial, since you should never aim to get one type of phenomenon, as before explained, for if you do, you shut out by your attitude all other phenomena which might spontaneously develop. At the same time, it is always satisfactory for the beginner to be able to control his phenomena a little, especially at first. And for this reason, the second method of experimentation is advisable, and if desired, might be carried out at the same time as the other method of development, so that the two progress side by side. If you sit in the dark, you should by all means provide yourself with a cabinet, since this will tend to concentrate the force, and much less energy will have to be expended by you for the production of any phenomena you may obtain. Also, you should abstain from using your will or thinking consciously of practical everyday affairs. Make the mind blank, holding only the thought of self and await results. How to develop in the light. In developing your power for the production of physical phenomena along the other line mentioned, it is best to begin with the simple experiments and gradually work up to the more complicated ones. For example, begin with a planchette or Ouija board, placing the tips of the fingers on the board, and after it has begun to move rapidly to and fro or round and round, very gradually withdraw the hand and see whether or not the board continues to move about. Again, when the table has begun to tip and rise into the air, two or three legs, as a result of placing your hands upon it, gradually withdraw your fingers and see whether the table remains suspended, or when it is at its highest point and you feel that it is thoroughly charged with your fluid, drop the whole force of your being into your will and see if you cannot levitate the table completely from the floor. Again, if wraps are coming on the table upon which your hands rest, see if these cannot be obtained when your hands are removed a fraction of an inch from its surface. And if they are, endeavor to produce wraps by making a motion towards the table as though hitting it, stopping short a quarter or half an inch above its surface. If you are successful, a wrap or a sound in the tabletop will come following this movement. Instruments for testing your power. A number of simple devices have been constructed with the object of testing mediumship in its early stages, and one or two of these you can make at home, and this would prove very helpful to you. Thus, you might suspend a small pitch or cork ball by means of a silk thread five or six inches long from a hook. If now you place the fingers of one hand almost touching this ball and leave it there for some moments, you may, if successful, succeed in causing this ball to move either towards or away from your fingers as you will. This is a very useful little experiment which may be tried on many occasions and will be found very beneficial in developing simple physical phenomena. Another device which may be employed is the following. Procure a straw, such as used at the soda fountains, and pass a needle through it directly in the center. Press the lower end of the needle into a large flat cork. See that the straw revolves easily upon the slightest pressure. Place your fingers nearly touching one end of the straw and will that it shall move either to the right or to the left. This instrument has proved very successful in many cases 
and will probably prove more sensitive than the last. There are more complicated scientific instruments which have been devised to test the externalization of the human fluid and the power of the will. These instruments have been used with great benefit by many scientific students. How to begin. When the student has progressed thus far, he is ready to try his first experiment in the movement of physical objects lying on his table. Begin with a very small, light object such as a cork. Do not choose any metal object. Place the fingertips of both hands on either side of the object nearly touching it. Wait until you feel distinct tingling sensations in the fingers, and if this sensation extends to the elbows or even to the shoulders, so much the better. Endeavor to construct by your will and imagination, so to speak, a fine thread or hair composed of psychic rays passing between your fingers and supporting the object in question. Concentrate on this for some moments before you make any physical movement. Then, very slowly raise the fingers and see whether the cork is influenced to follow the upper directions of your fingers. If so, you have begun your course of physical mediumship. As this initial experiment is very important, it would be well to dwell upon it at somewhat greater length, since nothing is so discouraging to the beginner as innumerable tests and experiments of this kind which fail one after the other. Of course, perfectly non-mediumistic persons will con continue to fail, but your natural psychics will not. How to obtain the first phenomena We have seen in an earlier chapter that the aura extends from the body, and particularly the fingertips, and that the human fluid is capable of projection at will. Now it is this fluid which is the basis or substance out of which the psychic threads or rays are spun, and these threads, when they have stretched from fingers to finger, and gain sufficient solidity are capable of lifting quite heavy objects. Dr. Ochorovitz, who has studied these rays for years, calls them rigid rays, and asserts that his medium, Mademoiselle Tomchik, can by an effort of will construct a psychic thread so strong that it can be heard scraping against solid objects and even seen occasionally. Yet it does not exist as a physical reality, for the space between the fingers and the object may be cut without severing the connection. Now these psychic threads are woven not of a physical but of etheric or astral matter. And as we do not know as yet how to mold or manipulate this accurately, we have to do the best we can by the power of the human will. The process to be followed therefore is, first, vivid imaginary construction of these rays or threads, second, projection of the vital fluid, and third, the weaving of this together into the rigid rays by an effort of will. If the student can follow this process and persistently carry out the instructions, he will doubtless succeed in time in moving small, light objects, that is, if he is at all gifted with this phase of mediumship. How to Construct the Vital Threads of Rigid Rays The details of this process may now be given. First of all, place yourself in a relaxed, restful condition. Then think intently of the threads or rays which you wish to produce. Imagine these just like any other threads coming from your fingertips and becoming more and more dense and solid as they emerge. Think of the strips of fluid you saw between your fingertips in trying the experiments mentioned in Chapter 25 devoted to the human fluid. When you have formed these vital rays clearly in your mind and have them all ready to project, so to say, extend the fingers and by a strong effort of will endeavor to project this energy into the space beyond the fingertips. After a very few trials, you will doubtless begin to do so. This you will feel in the form of pins and needles sensations in the fingertips. They will also get warm, perhaps perspire. When this second stage has been reached, you are ready to proceed with the third. The fluid thus projected is not in the form of rigid rays or threads, but rather a vaporous mass, a soft cloud, if the term be allowed, and you must toughen and strengthen this by willpower. After the projection has taken place, think and will intently that this shall happen, and this happening, and at the same time imagine your consciousness in your fingertips themselves molding and toughening these vital rays. If you do this, you will surely succeed in time, provided you go at the exercise in the right manner and stick to it persistently. Transferring the Power When the student has progressed thus far, the final step must be taken namely the transferring of this power to the control of a spirit or outside intelligence. This is a very delicate and subtle process, which is very little understood even by mediums. 
The best process is gradually to develop the power of going into trance coincidentally with the development of these physical phenomena. Once you have gained the power of projecting your fluid at will and moving material objects by its aid, which is probably attained by an extreme effort of will, you should endeavor to hand over this manipulative power to another intelligence. You cannot do this consciously, so you can only hope that the transference will take place when you have passed into trance. You should endeavor, therefore, to pass into trance while actually conducting the above-mentioned experiments, and the proof of the fact that this transference does take place is found in the fact that the most striking physical phenomena at a seance always occurs when the medium is in deep trance. The deeper the trance, the better the phenomena. In other words, the more the medium's will is in abeyance, the more opportunity is there given to the external will of the spirit to become active and bring about the required results. This fact is very strikingly proved by nearly all the best physical mediums in the history of spiritualism. Gathering Vital Energy from the Circle If you are unable to move material objects alone, you may perhaps be enabled to do so after gathering strength from others. You may do this either by forming a chain and gathering this energy by an effort of will before you make your experiment, or by placing your hands in position and asking the two members of the chain nearest to you to place their hands upon your temples, or one on your forehead, and the other over the solar plexus. In this way, a vital magnetic current is established, which may greatly add to your powers and enable you to move objects and produce phenomena where you would otherwise fail. End of chapter 38. Recording by Alex Caraz. Chapter 39 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 39. Spirit and Thought Photography. Spirit photographs are based on the belief that there is a spiritual body resembling in appearance the physical body, which is sufficiently solid to be photographed by means of the camera and sensitive plates. Usually more than this is necessary, namely the presence of a medium or psychic, possessing the peculiar power of rendering the spiritual body apparent to the camera. The medium seems to act as a sort of connecting link or intermediary between the body and the photographic plate, though the exact nature of the mediumistic influence is as yet unknown. Here is a field for study by expert photographers and by scientists to ascertain its limits and extent. How Spirit Photography is Possible To many it may appear incredible that any spiritual body is sufficiently material to be photographed by the camera for it would mean that this body is capable of reflecting light waves, this being the primary necessity in obtaining photographs at all. Yet, as Sir Oliver Lodge has pointed out, there is hardly anything more incredible in this than in taking the photograph of the reflection of an object in the mirror, which is quite possible. In this case, there is no solid object photographed, merely the reflected light waves which are themselves intangible and invisible. We know from experiment that the photographic camera is far more sensitive than the human eye. Physicians tell us that it is possible to photograph an eruption on the body before it actually occurs, that is, before it is visible to us, such as smallpox. On the other hand, it is also possible to photograph thousands of stars in the heavens, which are invisible to the eye, even with the most powerful telescope. A photographic plate can therefore detect objects insensible to the eye, and hence it is reasonable to suppose, insomuch as spiritual bodies doubtless exist, but are just beyond the range of our vision, that the camera should be quite able to detect them, and spirit photographs are the result. Two sources of error and how to guard against them. In obtaining spirit photographs, you must be on your guard against two possible sources of error. The first is that you are liable to see faces and likenesses in the photographs which do not really exist at all you construct them in imagination as you would faces in a coal fire. The second danger to be avoided, if you are dealing with a professional spirit photographer, is that of fraud. There has doubtless been much trickery in this department in the past, and if you wish to be sure that you are not victimized, you should take your own plates with you, see them inserted in the camera, and watch their development after the picture has been taken. Even in this case, you are liable to be imposed upon unless you are very careful. How to begin your development. 
The most satisfactory course to pursue is to experiment yourself and not depend upon a professional spirit photographer for your results. If you are at all sensitive and persevering, you will doubtless obtain genuine spirit photographs at the end of a certain period of time. Many hundreds of persons have done so, and there is no reason why you should not, if you are determined to obtain them. The best method is to sit privately with a friend of yours who is both sympathetic and more or less mediumistic, and hold a short seance, seated at the table before you begin your experiments in photography. If you obtain messages by means of tippings of the table, raps, automatic writing, etc., so much the better, and if intelligent communication is thus established, ask your spirit friends to appear for you on the plate when the experiments are being held. They may promise to do so, but fail to appear. Do not be discouraged by this, as they may be perfectly willing to help you, but for some reason or another are unable to make their forms visible on the photographic plate. If you persist, however, you will doubtless obtain interesting results in a short time. How to Take the Photographs after this preliminary seance, you should seat your subject in a chair against a dark background and focus the camera as you would were you taking this picture in the ordinary way. The photographic plate should, if possible, be held by both of you between your hands in the dark room before being inserted in the camera so as to get it impregnated with your magnetism. After he has taken up his position and the camera is properly focused, you should then ask your spirit friends to come and appear on the plate if possible. Do not exercise your will, however, nor think of any special object in particular, nor any person, but make your mind negative. If positive, you are quite likely to obtain thought photographs instead. Ask your invisible helpers to give you some sign, if possible, such as three raps when they are ready to appear, etc. If you obtain these, take the picture at once. If not, sit until you get into the requisite mental condition then take the photograph and afterwards develop it carefully. It is improbable that you will obtain any definite results for the first few experiments, but many do, even from the start, and this is doubtless one of the most promising of all the fields of psychic investigation for the student to enter. Radiographs and how to obtain them. The next thing to do is to endeavor to secure photographs of the rays or aura of the human body. These impressions on the photographic plate are secured comparatively rarely for the reason that the body of the subject must become radioactive to some extent before an impression of this kind is possible. Such pictures are consequently called radiographs, and a number of these have been obtained by Dr. Chorovich of Poland. The rays in question, which impress the photographic plates in such cases, seem to emanate from the etheric double and not from the physical body for the reason that they do not follow the anatomical distribution of the nerves of the body. The double, detached after the manner described in chapter 26, can often affect the plates in this way, and spirits can do so, but it is not common for the human body to be able thus to affect them. How to obtain thought photographs. The third and most interesting phase, in a sense, for the experimenter is that of thought photography. The most sensitive plates that can be procured should be used for this purpose and the experiment conducted in the dark, as indeed should the radiograph experiments. The plate may be held between the palms of the hands or placed against the forehead or over the solar plexus next to the skin and must be left there for a considerable time, half an hour or longer, if possible. During this time the subject should think intensely of a certain figure or object, such as a cat, a chair, a ship, as the case may be. He should keep this before his mind vividly and intensely and never allow it to become blurred or indistinct. Holding it there by an effort of will, he should next endeavor to impress this upon the photographic plate and should also try to feel inwardly the process going on within him, the flow of the magnetic current to the spot beneath the plate, etc. Another way to produce thought photographs Another way of obtaining thought photographs is to place a plate wrapped in black paper or placed in an opaque black envelope on the table, and over it place the fingertips for some time, usually from 5 to 10 minutes. Then think or will that a certain thought or image will be impressed upon the plate, and if you are at all developed along this line, the impress will be left on the plate through the paper. Any object can be selected, a round ring of light, triangle, a face, etc. 
It is best to begin with simple objects because the mind seems to be able to impress this upon the plate more readily and clearly than a more complex object, of which it cannot form so clear an outline. You must not be disappointed if you do not succeed at first in this, and you may have to develop, and thus spoil, a number of plates before you get any impression at all upon them. The first thing you will get, probably, will be a spot of light, or a series of small spots, as the fluid finds its way through the opaque paper onto the plate. You must remember that the human fluid is the instrument or intermediary through which photographs of this character are made, and hence you must learn the art of the projection of this fluid, as outlined in the chapter devoted to physical phenomena, before you can hope successfully to impress a photographic plate. Once you have done so, the rest will be simply a matter of development, and you will find it one of the most interesting and fascinating subjects for the investigation in the whole realm of psychics. Photographs of Psychic Forms and Emotions In many cases, photographs of emotions have been successfully taken, especially of late, and M. Doguet has narrated a number of experiments of this character to the French Academy of Sciences, which has accepted his report as authentic. It is thus evident that thought photography has at length claimed a place in the scientific world, and this being so, it is only a matter of careful experimenting on the student's part before he obtains photographs of his character. An interesting series of experiments might be tried by the scientifically minded inquirer, namely to obtain photographs of mediums in trance, while they are obtaining automatic writing, crystal gazing, etc., and also of those who are on the point of dying. Such experiments would doubtless reveal many changes in the aura, and also the presence of thought images and possibly spirit forms, which would otherwise be quite unsuspected by those present. End of chapter 39. Recording by Alex Caraz. Chapter 40 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Carrington. Chapter 40 Materialization. Materialization means the process of rendering solid or material, for a longer or shorter time, bodies through which disembodied spirits may function and communicate. Materialization usually occurs at seances in which a group of people are gathered together, and rarely or never when the medium is alone. The reason for this is probably that the necessary conditions are lacking, these being chiefly the lack of sufficient vital energy which is drawn from the circle by the medium and utilized for the purposes of materialization. The Marvels of Materialization Many factors play a part in this mysterious phenomenon. Considered from the physical or material point of view, there is the reality of the phantom, and from the psychological or mental point of view, there is the mind of the materialized entity to account for. If we were always sure that the materialized figure were really the person it claimed to be, this latter difficulty would be overcome. But as we shall see later, there are many objections to the simple view of the case in all instances, and thus the problem is rendered more complex. From the purely physical point of view, the phenomena of materialization are the most baffling and the most mysterious in the whole realm of spiritualism. A few minutes before, nothing existed in the cabinet save the entranced medium. Now, there is a solid, tangible form possessing all the properties and appearances of matter, often having solid flesh and bones just as a human being would. The flesh being warm and lifelike, the hand possessing nails, hair, etc., like an ordinary hand, and being apparently composed of cells and tissues, such as any material body would be composed of. How account for this? It is surely one of the most bewildering and incredible facts in nature. The Necessary Factors to Ensure Success From the point of view of spiritualism and psychic development, many factors play a part. There is first of all the physical body of the medium, secondly his vital magnetism, Thirdly, the magnetism of the sitters forming the circle. Fourthly, magnetism from disembodied spirits, which mingle together and help to create the phantoms that appear at seances. 
The vital energy which seems to be drawn from the circle, and chiefly from the medium, during the seances is utilized or manipulated by the disembodied spirits, who build up by its aid the materialized form we see before us. This is a very difficult and complicated process, and not all spirits are competent to do this. For this purpose, what are known as spirit chemists are often employed, those who possess the knowledge of how to build up these forms. In the deepest stages of trance, when the medium is unconscious, the communication through materialized figures becomes clearer and clearer and the forms more dense and material. This is true of many psychic phenomena. The deeper the trance, the better the results obtained. Etherealization and Transfiguration In the lighter stages of trance, however, only portions of the figure may develop, such as hands, faces, etc., or very shadowy and vaguely defined outlines of human forms. These latter are not, strictly speaking, materialized, but are known as etherealized forms. They are less solid than the materialized figures, and it is often possible to pass the hand and arm through one of these figures without disturbing it. In the case of the materialized figure, on the other hand, they are just as solid and tangible as human form, and it would be impossible to make any other solid object pass through any part of them. In many cases, the physical body of the medium is more or less altered by the spirits without any other phantom being created. Such cases are known as transfiguration. When the figure created at the seance is not dense and fully formed, it does not possess either a complete or matured intelligence. It is not all there, so to speak, mentally or physically. How some forms are created. There is evidence to show that many of these forms are created by the will of the medium or by discarnate spirits, and that they are more truly thought forms than materialized spirits. Again, many of these figures are doubles, or astral bodies, belonging to living people, who happen to appear at the seance, or projections from discarnate spirits. In such case, the intelligence manipulating the phantom is not that of a mature spirit, but is a creation, so to speak, elaborated by the subconscious thoughts of the medium or by the mentality of the sitters forming the circle. The psychic atmosphere created by the minds in this circle has, in other words, produced the mind of the phantom in the same way that the combined vital magnetism of the sitters has produced the material body of the apparition. How Materialization is Accomplished The process of materialization seems to be somewhat as follows. The vital energy being drawn from the sitters into the body of the medium the latter projects it outward into space. Together with a large portion of his own vital energy, or it is drawn out by the operating intelligences. When in space, at a short distance from the medium's body, this vital energy is molded, so to say, into the shape of the materialized form. It is built up or created by the operating intelligences. Between this form and the medium's physical body, there exists a subtle connection or rapport which has been described as a thread or bond of union, though it is not a physical connection of any kind, or one that has ever been detected. Yet, that such a connection exists is proved by the phenomena of repercussion, referred to in chapter 36, where it is shown that any injury done to the projected form reacted upon the body of the medium and left its mark upon it, just as though the physical form had suffered the injury. This is one of the most striking phenomena in the whole realm of spiritualism, and a case of this character is thus vividly described by the Venerable Archdeacon Kali in his address on spiritualism before the Church Congress which met in October 1905 and subsequently published by him in pamphlet form. He then said, He, the material phantom, seemed to be interested in everything around him, walked up and down the room, taking up various articles to examine them. As would be natural to one of ancient race now in the midst of modern environment. Presently he espied and brought from the sideboard a dish of baked apples, and I got him to eat some. Our medium was at this time six or seven feet away from the spirit form, and had not chosen to take any of the fruit, asserting that he could taste the apple the Egyptian was eating. Wondering how this could be, I with my right hand gave our abnormal friend another apple to eat holding a bit of white paper in my left hand outstretched toward the medium, when from his lips 
fell the chewed skin and core of the apple eaten by the Mahidi. Here it is before me now, after all these years, and this screwed up bit of paper for any scientist to analyze. In this instance, the phenomena of repercussion was very interestingly demonstrated. The method of the materialization of the figure was thus described by Archdeacon Colley in his lecture. How the figures are formed. When, in expectation of a materialization, there was seen steaming as from a kettle spout through the texture and substance of the medium's black coat, a little below the left breast toward the side, a vaporous filament which was almost invisible until within an inch or two of our friend's body. Then it grew in density to a cloudy something. There would then step forth timidly a figure, as did this little maiden. She was naturally a companion for others of our frequent psychic visitors. For as a cloud received one out of their sight, when the disciples at Bethany gazed on their ascending Lord, so as from a cloud thus inexplicably evolved from the medium, came our materialized friends, and vanished again to invisibility in a cloud, sucked back within his own body, when they were withdrawn from us, wistfully gazing on the mysterious departure and noting this or that particular phase of it within a few inches of the point of their inscrutable disappearance and the vanishment. The Clothes of Materialized Figures The question is often asked, how is it possible for spirits to become clothed? The old question of the clothes of ghosts being often raised among materialistic skeptics of the last century. The same question might be raised against the clothes of materialized figures, but there is a ready answer to this which fully explains it. Those who deny and ridicule the possibility of materialization of remnant, as well as bodies, might ask themselves the question, whence came the clothing which Christ wore after his resurrection? For we are distinctly told that the master's raiment had been parted among the Roman soldiery, and upon his cloak had they cast lots. This historical incident furnishes us with an illustration of the case in point, and the reality of this fact is amply borne out by many modern instances of a like character. How to begin your development In sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, which should not be too large, so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane-bottomed chair, sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. How to begin your development In sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, which should not be too large, so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane-bottomed chair, sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. At first, the medium should hold the hands of those in the circle, but after a time these may be released. The light should be almost totally extinguished for reasons given before in this book. It must be remembered that there are all kinds of light, visible and invisible. We also have infrared rays and ultraviolet rays, the former being below the lowest form of visible vibration and the latter above the highest. It is because red is so low on the scale of vibration that mediums employ it during the seance. Photographs may be taken by infrared and ultraviolet light. Light has a very disintegrating effect on these subtle forms and would doubtless serve to disintegrate many of the materialized forms upon their initial appearance. The medium should make his mind as blank as possible, holding only the central idea of self, and mentally call upon his spirit friends to help in the production of phenomena. Early Signs and Phenomena among the initial sensations which the medium will experience are probably flashes of heat and cold, blackness before the eyes, in which possibly there may be specks of light dancing hither and thither, and the cobwebby sensation over the hands and face, which is almost invariable and very noticeable. Madame d'Esperance, a materializing medium of international fame, has stated that in her experience this cobwebby sensation was present on practically every occasion. Speaking of the phenomena and symptoms of the process, she says, If a few persons have gathered together in a half-darkened room, the emanations from their bodies can be seen by many, not necessarily clairvoyance. It appears as a slightly luminous haze about the head, shoulders, and sometimes the knees and feet. Frequently it gathers slowly at the fingers, increasing in density until it resembles a slight transparent film of slightly luminous cotton wool. This is often perceptible to the eyes of all, 
but it offers no resistance to the touch. By some force of attraction, either inherent or exerted upon it by some outside agency, this mass appears to mingle and draw together, to become more dense, and at this stage has been found to be decidedly receptible to the touch. It resembles, as nearly as can be described, the gossamer web seen on trees and bushes on an early summer morning. The Sensation of Cobwebs and What It Means Many persons in a materialization seance are sensible of a feeling as of cobwebs being on their faces and hands. I have myself not only felt the sensation, but when brushing my face or hands have distinctly felt what seemed to be fine filaments of the gossamer which clung to my fingers. The attention of the sitters has been frequently drawn to this almost impalpable substance which has vanished as soon as the light has been brought near it. This emanation from the sitters in a seance is generally if not always, accompanied by a sensation of chill or draft, similar to that felt by a person in a slightly feverish condition. The head will be hot, there will be a heavy throbbing in the temples. The hands, feet, and other parts of the body will be cold to the touch. The medium, by the exercise of his will, can at any time prevent manifestations. In fact, the opposition of any person in a circle will act as a hindrance to the work of the unseen operators. Why some forms resemble the medium. As a rule, when full materializations are accomplished, the medium is entranced so deeply that he cannot remember the process of the production of the forms. In the earlier stages of trance, the mind should be concentrated on the creation of forms of this character, but after it has reached a certain stage, you may safely turn over the process to your spirit friends. In some instances, the medium's double becomes detached from the body and appears to those forming the circle as a materialized figure, though it is not such in reality. If such a figure be photographed or closely examined, the striking resemblance to the medium is easily seen, though it is not the medium who may be seen entranced within the cabinet. Lack of knowledge of this fact has given rise to the false belief that in cases of this character, the medium himself was consciously personating the spirit but the true explanation is that the double has been liberated during the seance and has thus appeared to the sitters as an independent being. The phenomena of materialization, as before said, are amongst the most interesting in the whole realm of the supernormal and will well repay careful study and the prolonged experimentation on the part of the student. End of chapter 40. Recording by Alex Caraz. Chapter 41 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 41 Advanced Studies the subject matter and advice contained in the present chapter is advanced only for those who have carefully read through and practiced the preceding chapters of this book. Those who have not done so are strongly advised not to undertake some of the experiments herein described unless they have carefully carried out the instructions contained in the earlier chapters, and particularly the warnings herein given. These advanced studies are suitable only for those students who have succeeded in attaining a certain mastery of the inner self, and who have developed a certain amount of psychic force or power which is under their own control. In a certain sense they may be considered more or less dangerous, but they are not so to one who has progressed sufficiently to be in a position to follow them. Progress is necessary in psychic development as in every other field of endeavor, and those who have gone thus far should try to advance their powers and faculties yet another step forward into that vast and mystic beyond which encircles us on every side, not only in the life to come, but here and now. Cultivating the Sixth Sense The first thing for the student to do is to cultivate, as far as possible, his sixth sense already mentioned briefly in chapter 19, devoted to the cultivation of sensitiveness. This sixth sense is a general feeling of awareness of surrounding powers and entities, a knowledge which is not dependent on any of the five senses. 
some of the preliminary exercises for cultivating this sense have already been given and we shall now proceed to give a few more leading the student yet further along the path to self-realization and power he should first of all begin with deep breathing exercises accompanied by certain psychical processes and practices the process of taking the complete breath has already been described in chapter six and while the student is in the relaxed condition previously mentioned he should concentrate his mind and carry out the following psychic formula psychic breathing exercises breathe rhythmically until the rhythm is perfectly established then inhaling and exhaling form the mental image of the breath being drawn up through the bones of the legs and then forced out through them then through the bones of the arms then the top of the skull then through the stomach then through the reproductive region then as if it were traveling upward and downward along the spinal column and then as if the breath were being inhaled and exhaled through every pore of the skin the whole body being filled with prana vital energy or life and breathing rhythmically send the current or prana to the seven vital centers in turn as follows using the same mental picture as in the previous exercises first to the very end of the spinal cord second to the reproductive region next to the center of the abdomen next to the solar plexus then to the heart then to the throat then to a spot between the eyes low down on the forehead finally to a spot at the very top of the brain finish by sweeping the current of prana to and fro from head to foot several times how to awaken the chakras or seven vital centers these seven vital centers in the body are known as chakras and have very great interest and importance in all higher psychic development and in all occult practice it is upon the awakening of these seven centers in fact that all the higher clairvoyance and psychical faculties depend they are supposed to be the links of connection between the physical and the astral bodies and if they are not awakened in precisely the right order and in the right manner grave difficulties may result while on the other hand if they are awakened correctly the student who has done so is instantly gifted with extraordinary clairvoyant and higher psychical faculties enabling him not only to see the past and the future but also all those spiritual beings who are constantly around him the thoughts and emotions of others pictures of their past lives etc in other words much depends upon the awakening of these centers in eastern philosophy they are symbolized as lotus flowers and the highest and last in the brain is called the thousand and one petaled lotus importance of awakening in the right order the vital energy which passes upward through these centers is symbolized as a fiery serpent which in passing upward animates each in turn and wakes them into activity and it is highly important that this current of energy should pass through each center in the right order as before said the sensation of warmth and a faint prickling as of pins and needles is felt at the moment of awakening each of these centers in sanskrit the word kundalini literally meaning the coiled up is employed this serpent when fully aroused and activated leads not only to the awakening of the higher psychical faculties before mentioned but also to others of a still more startling character swami vivekananda in his lectures on raja yoga page ninety one gives the following psychical exercises which should be practiced in connection with this psychical unfoldment and development the sacred word om and meditation sit straight and look at the tip of your nose by controlling the two optic nerves one advances a long way towards the control of the arc of reaction and so to the control of the will imagine a lotus upon the top of the head several inches up and virtue as its center the stalk as knowledge the eight petals of the lotus are the eight powers of the yogi inside the stamens and pistils are renunciation 
inside of the lotus think of the golden one the almighty the intangible he whose name is om the inexpressible surrounded with effulgent light meditate on that think of a space in your heart and in the midst of that space think that a flame is burning think of that flame in your own soul and inside that flame in another space effulgent and that is the soul of your soul god meditate on that in the heart he who has given up all attachment all fear and all anger he who has taken refuge in the lord whose heart has become purified with whatsoever desire he comes to the lord he will grant that to him internal or spiritual respiration another valuable practice in connection with breathing is that which is known as internal or spiritual respiration the idea is based upon the belief that in addition to our physical lungs there are also spiritual lungs and that just as the physical lungs receive energy and are purified by the air we breathe so also are the spiritual lungs energized and filled by the power of spirit when accompanied by suitable psychical and mental processes the power of the word om so often repeated in eastern philosophy may be perceived faintly by anyone pronouncing the word slowly several times in succession when it will be seen that it has a peculiar psychical effect upon the individual and that it sets up remarkable rhythmic vibrations throughout the whole being which become more and more noticeable as the word is repeated this is the most holy word of the vedas or sacred books of the east and its symbolic meaning is the supreme being the ocean of knowledge or bliss absolute seeing with any part of the body one other valuable exercise which should be practiced is that of seeing or endeavoring to see with any part of the body as though eyes were situated at any point upon which you concentrate your forces and that you were actually looking outward from that point this power has been cultivated to an extraordinary extent by some of the eastern adepts and is recorded as happening spontaneously now and then even now in the east the power is cultivated by an effort of attention coupled by will and should be preceded by the practice of traveling around the body in thought mentioned before in this book and then holding yourself consciously on one particular point in your circuit of the body and concentrating yourself on that point at this stage of your development you may begin to practice an exercise which would be of great benefit not only to yourself but to others also after you have fallen asleep and the astral body is thereby loosened from the physical body you should learn to make use of this astral body during the hours of sleep and send it on journeys to help those who may be in need of this help you may after a certain amount of effort thus project the astral body and cause it to retain full self-consciousness when this has been acquired this projected body can assist those who have recently died comforting and consoling them and can carry messages from such a person to those still living it can assist those in danger and help along humanity in a thousand different ways when you have learned to project your astral body in this manner during sleep you are known as one of the invisible helpers and many persons are said to make it a business to perform at least one good action every night during sleep the development of cosmic consciousness two remarkable psychical manifestations will result from these spiritual practices if correctly and carefully performed the first is the enlargement of the self until it attains a vast area so to speak which has been called cosmic consciousness by those who have experienced it this consciousness is a step higher than human consciousness just as the human is a step higher than the animal and enables us to perceive truth and spiritual reality behind the universe in addition to stimulating remarkable psychic powers such realities as the fourth dimension which are usually quite incapable of being appreciated by our finite senses are said to be clear and intelligible to those who possess cosmic consciousness 
and the connection between spirit and matter is also clear to them. POWER OVER ANIMATE AND INANIMATE MATTER The second remarkable development from the awakening of these higher spiritual faculties will be the greater power you possess over animate and inanimate nature. You will find that you exert a peculiar influence over all animals with whom you come into contact, and that they not only know and understand you, but if the animals are wild, they will not harm you in any way. It is stated that many of the yogis of India can walk uninjured through dense jungles filled with tigers and venomous snakes. These facts throw a new and interesting light upon the account of Daniel in the den of lions. Doubtless all the biblical narratives of this kind can be rationally accounted for when we have acquired sufficient knowledge of psychic and spiritual science. Even the case of the three men who were cast into the fiery furnace and escaped uninjured. Several mediums have done the same thing on a small scale. Sir William Crookes has reported that he has seen the medium D. D. Holm extract red-hot coals from the fire and hold them in his hands without injury. Similarly, the magicians or witch-doctors of many of the savage tribes can walk over glowing coals or red-hot embers without being burned, after they have undergone certain religious rites and preparations. In addition to this, you will have increased power over inorganic matter, so that you can move objects without contact, with comparative ease, and cause phenomenal changes to take place in those objects you will find that you have in an almost perfect degree the power of self-projection, that you can leave your body and enter the astral plane at will, exploring it and observing its denizens. CREATION BY THE POWER OF WILL Finally, you will be able actually to create by the power of your thought forms and objects which are external and apparently objective, in other words, you will have learned to create by the power of the will, and this is one of the greatest achievements gained by the advanced student of the occult. Phantoms, apparitions, thought forms, etc., are created in this way. It is impossible at this time to enter more deeply into these questions. Higher exercises of this kind, to be explained fully as they should be, would require a further course of study and it is my intention to follow the present work with a second one which will contain more detailed advice as to the development of the higher psychical and spiritual faculties for the present i must leave the psychic student here at the end of his preparatory studies wishing him success in his efforts in the attainment of psychic power if the student will but follow the directions contained in the present work carefully and at the same time pay due attention to the advice contained therein, he will be enabled to develop his psychic powers to a very great extent, and will thereby be fitted to undertake still more advanced studies, which will be taken up very fully in a subsequent work. The End End of Chapter 41 Advanced Studies Recording by Pamela Krantz End of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them 